Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome to Policy and Resources Committee. Um, we will do, as usual, procedural business first. 23A, are there any declarations of substitutes? Councillor Davey. Councillor Davey for Councillor Shanks. Thank you. Councillor Robbins. Uh, Councillor Robbins for Councillor Lepper. Sorry, no, mine's the next one. Sorry, I'm too keen, Chairman. You are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there any declarations of interest of any disclosable pecuniary or general interest in relation to any matters included on the agenda? Well, Chairman, I was declaring an interest, pecuniary interest, on the um, city urban fringe item, but I understand yep. that that's been pulled, so Correct. I assume, therefore, I do not need now Correct. to declare any interest. Correct. I think so. Yep. I'm, I'm not at Chairman's Commons yet, but I will get to that. We have to do this bit first. Um, 23C, exclusion of press and public. Does the committee agree to retain the items listed in part two of the agenda and as such request members of the press and public and any members or officers who do not have a direct interest in the items to leave the chamber when those items are reached? As per the agenda, in other words. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 24 minutes of the meeting held on the 12th of June 2014. Do we agree that they are correct records? Good. Unanimous, I take it. Good. Thank you very much. Right. Um, 25, Chairman's Communications. So, as always, today's meeting will be webcast live and will be capable of repeated viewing. And as Councillor Hamilton suggested, in light of um, the feedback that we've had um, and indications that there wasn't going to be support for the Urban Fringe report as it stood, I'm going to defer that report so that we can have further conversations about that and um, further briefings and work in the hope that we can return in the autumn with that report. Well, I think that should have happened before. Um, there's okay. no way I could possibly support this, uh, this report that's coming right. forward, and I would have voted against it. I have just made that clear. Okay, um, so since our last meeting, we've been awarded several trophies for our work, and I'd like to thank the officers, partners, and colleagues for their dedication in achieving the excellence that's won those awards. Um, our scrutiny team gained recognition from the Center for Public Scrutiny at the Good Scrutiny Awards, where they were winners in the Involvement, Insight, and Impact category for our trans scrutiny work. And Stonewall recently named us the top council for tackling homophobia and biphobia in schools, noting our partnership work and the work of the All Sorts Youth Project. And last week, the Royal Town Planning Institute praised us for our joint work with neighboring authorities on duty to cooperate, um, which is very significant for us and other authorities trying to bring forward our city plans. Um, it's also the fifth award won by the planning team in the last three years. So let's hope we can give them what the award they really want, which is a, a city plan agreed by inspector. We've also been successful in attracting funding. Our Volks Railway has won a successful first round bid from the Heritage Lottery Fund, monies from which will be used to restore and upgrade facilities. We'll now have to draw up detailed plans to submit a bid for round two. Uh, the HLF have awarded the Council a development grant of £96,000 to develop the scheme further. Uh, and the Royal Pavilion and Museum has been awarded over £2 million and a prestigious major partner museum status by Arts Council England. This recognizes 21 museums across the country that have demonstrated excellence and ambition. So over the next three years, the Arts Council investment of over two million will enable the Royal Pavilion Museums to provide, uh, continue providing the great cultural experience for more people than ever. And highlights will include new exhibitions and art programs, extensive new volunteering and skills development opportunities, more collections being put online, bold imaginative use of our treasures to inspire learning and creativity for community groups, children, and young people. Um, and as you may have heard on Monday, we learned that the Greater Brighton City Region benefited from 52.4 million of investment through the Local Enterprise Partnership and the Government Strategic Plan um, Growth Deal process, um, which will boost our shared local economy and support jobs, infrastructure and transport. We will receive significant funding for key developments in Brighton Hove, including Circus Street, Preston Barracks, Valley Gardens, and some funding for to be a, a leader on 5G um, wireless research. This will help to build on our status as the third best location in the UK for business investment and our let was in the top 10 for money received uh, for the growth deal. So thank you to everyone who worked really hard on that. It was a huge piece of work in a very short amount of time. So thank you. We now go to call over. Um, so we'll ask Ross to go through the items and please indicate those you wish to reserve for discussion by calling them as appropriate. You know the drill. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, item 29, Treasury Management Policy Statement. Item 29. Item 30, TBM Month 2. Second. Item 31, Waivers of Contract Standing Orders. Item 32, Budget and Corporate Plan Preparation. Item 32. Item 34, Annual Performance Update. Yes, Item 35, Minimum Buying Standards for Catering Contracts. Item 36, Home to School Special Needs Pupil Transport and Other Social Care Transport Contract. Item 37, Procurement of Waste and Recycling Contract. Item 38, Shared Lives Tender Contract. Item 39, Cash in Transit Contract. Item, 39. Item 40, Hove Town Hall South End Office Option. Item, 40. Item 41, Port Slade Sports Centre Future Management Arrangements. Item 42, Stanmer Park Master Plan. 46. Item 43, Disposal of 18 Market Street. And then the part two ones, 46, uh, Stanmer Park Plan and Application for Heritage Lottery Fund Grant. 46. And 47, Disposal of Market Street. Oh, sorry. Sorry, there's a part one, one 44, Appointment to the Fire Authority. Okay. So, so items 31, 36, 43 have been agreed as per the officer recommendations. Thank you. So can we just run through the ones that have been called? Just yep, sure. Sorry. So items called, we've got 29, item 30, item 32, item 34, Item 35, and then 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, and 46 in part two. 44. 44, sorry. We did call that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, public involvement, 27A, there are no petitions. 27B, we do have a written question from Mr. Adrian Morris concerning the aquarium terraces. Mr. Morris, would you like to come forward to the microphone and put your question? Thank you, Chair. I would like actually to point out that this is incorrectly stated. It is in fact the aquarium terraces, not the arches. Okay. okay, but that has been noted. Thank you very much. Um, the aquarium terraces above Madeira Drive are in a chronic state of neglect and decay, with empty units, broken windows, boarded up areas, a half-painted boardwalk, tattered flags, and rubbish. As we approach the summer season, it's a blight on the seafront. What action has the Green Council taken in putting pressure on the owners of the terraces to bring out bring about repairs and improvements. Okay. Sorry, I did it for you. Um, so thank you for the question. The freehold of this site is owned by the council. However, a 150-year lease was granted in 1998, which is now held by an investment company. The directors of that company are based abroad, and communication is only via their UK agents. Under the terms of the lease, the leaseholders are responsible for maintaining the property in good repair. The council has consistently and regularly contacted the leaseholder's agent requesting rectification of the ongoing and accruing disrepair that you note, but to no avail. The council has served a preliminary notice on the leaseholders requiring them to address a range of repairs, and as you've also noted to date, this notice has been ignored by the agent and the company directors. The council are therefore preparing to serve a formal schedule of dilapidations on the leaseholders, accompanied by a notice to forfeit their lease, i.e. termination of the lease. However, it's important to note that the leaseholders have a right to apply to the court for relief from the termination of their lease, and we'll have to wait and see if they do that. But the council is doing all it can within its legal powers at the moment. Do you have a supplementary? Yes, I do, Chair. Thank you for those comments. Um, I have a brief statement to make to that response, and part of, you, part of it you have covered 
in your reply that there's a considerable amount outstanding. Residents have well, been... So, sorry, but it's sorry. a time question. So if you've got a statement, I'm more than happy to take that in writing if you want to write to me, but it's well, a supplementary it, question. Well, okay, it does concern Brighton Seafront Regener Regeneration Limited, who I think you were referring to. It also refers to uh, the foundation group who are now handling the site, as I understand. The fact that Terraces Bar and Grill were one of the most successful businesses on site, causing them loss of revenue over the heavily booked Christmas period and New Year during the whole of January. I do know about the item that you refer to about the leaseholders who are Brighton Seafront Regeneration. I understand to strike off who actually were given strike off. I'm sorry, by but Mr. I, I need to hear a question. Okay, I will go straight to the question, but I accept that part the part about uh, the, um, uh, which you mentioned about uh, the, the formal schedule, which I understand has been, uh, is in the process of actually being uh, put forward. Um, the, okay, the Aquarian Terrace is, is managed by the council's preferred estate management uh, agent, Cluttons. And in the, con in the consideration of what I have outlined just just now, actually the question is, can this Green Council explain why they have not been more proactive and taken action sooner, either directly or through their estate management agent, Cluttons? Okay, thank you very much for your question. I'll respond to you in writing. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, to, it will be. 28, member involvement. Petitions, there are no petitions. Letters, there are no letters. But we do have a notice of motion concerning food banks in the city referred from the council held on the 8th of May. Um, I'm just going to offer this short response to it, and then Councillor Randall, who's the lead member on this, is going to add a word. So, of course, um, welcome the point of the motion, and we've long recognised the role food banks play in tackling food poverty, and pleased the motion was supported by council. Um, there are currently 10 food banks in the city run by local independent groups responding to local demand, and this has increased from there being only two in 2013. Um, the council has a tripartite approach in relation to food poverty, working in partnership with others by commissioning and grants and in delivering some services directly. Bill has the detail, but I think it's important to stress that the council is only one of several organizations addressing food poverty. Um, we're already doing a lot to address and understand the situation that has prompted this recent proliferation in food banks. So with that in mind, I'm not reminded to ask for a uh, production of a report on our support for food banks. I'd rather we spent officer time actually on, on focusing to address the real issues and, and support the work that's ongoing, but I'll ask Bill to, to add more on, on the work that's ongoing. Well, um, at the moment we support fair share itself, actually, and we support food banks in the city. And of course, we support financially in other ways some of those organizations who run food banks. One example, for instance, being the Brighton Women's Centre, which runs a food bank every Thursday, which I have to say is oversubscribed, like many of the other food banks in the city, which are indeed, if you like, a metaphor for the times that we live in. But the work we do with food banks doesn't end with the distribution of food. Food banks are a way of accessing people with a whole portfolio of other problems, apart from not having enough to eat. And it is a way into quite often people who otherwise self-exclude. Uh, certainly the one in my ward that has been running on the Pankhurst estate, the community workers there running that food bank have met for the first time people with, with, with other issues who've never approached them before but have come forward because they need, needed, needed the food. It also means, of course, we can put people in, in, in touch with ways of taking positive action about their situation through our new Money Works partnership, which you might have seen. We had a soft launch of last week, which includes uh, the credit union, the, the CAB, uh, MAX, the Money and Community Advisory Service, and also the Whitehall Kin, the Bridge, the Hamilton and Old Project, uh, the Brighton Unemployed Workers Centre, and also um, as a sort of satellite, the Brighton Women's Centre. Through the food bank, we're able to talk to the people who come there to offer them ways of looking at their financial system, of perhaps helping them to train for work through some of those organizations and making sure they get all the benefits they're entitled to. 
you might remember Max did a, a, a spectacularly good piece of work with some of our own tenants um, a couple of years ago and I think realised about £380,000 in extra benefits that people were not claiming. The other important part of this too is it gives them access to our digital learning um, and as you'll know that there is a big problem about uh, uh, digital exclusion in this city and we have a government that if they ever get round to introducing universal credit would expect everybody to do it online and a lot of people at the moment do not have the facility to do that so it is deeply important that we do that work. So food banks are a way in, they're not an end in themselves, they help people with the immediate the short term programme but they're part of our overall plan to tackle poverty uh, and deprivation in the city. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Morgan. Thanks, Chair. Uh, obviously, this was uh, a motion approved by full council. Uh, I do appreciate and acknowledge all of the work that's been done both by the council, its officers, and other agencies in this regard. Um, I am uh, unhappy that we uh, are not looking at bringing a report forward. We bring forward a lot of reports to council on, on large things and small things. This is an issue that affects over 3,000 people in the city, part of the 11,000 people we've got in Brighton and Hove living in poverty. I think it's important that we address this issue. Obviously, we've committed to look at it in a much broader context through a fairness commission that we've committed uh, the council to should we win next year. I think this would be a step in that direction, and I would urge you to bring a report to the next meeting. Okay. Um, I meant to say also written to the managers of all the major supermarkets, asking them to provide support for food banks um, directly, but also to have collection points for donations from their customers. Um, so um, I, we have two proposals. One is which to note this um, motion and to um, uh, uh, note the good work the officers are doing this. And we have an alternative proposal to seek a report on this matter. Um, given there are two views, I'm going to put that to the vote. Um, okay, it's not seeing any indications from there. Um, yes, there you go. Okay, right. Any proposal and seconder for each. So um, do you have a seconder, Warren? There we go. Um, do I have a seconder? Good. All right. That's that. Is there any alternative from there? No? We'll have a vote then. So all those in favour of noting the notice of motion, please show. Right. All those against that proposal? Well, we have to vote on each proposal. That's the way we do things here. It's old-fashioned, like. So three. Any abstentions? I, I think there's a sort of abstention yeah, going on in that department. I, I'm so um, I, I actually, I was looking at you, but I wasn't listening to you, and I, I do apologise. <laughs> Can I appreciate your honesty? Yeah. Um, what were we voting on, Chair? Right, I, we've sorry. had a notice of motion before us, and the committee then has to decide what to do with that. We can either note it or seek a report on the matters raised in it, and we've had two proposals. One is to note it, and the other is to seek an officer report to return to this committee at a future date. We're currently voting on the proposal to note it. I'm sorry, but uh, as a subsequent one was actually to actually really amend the, um, I thought that one would be put first. That's it's what it's not about amendments. amendments, it's about what we do with the referral of the notice of motion. Right, okay. So, could, you, uh, could I plead insanity and ask you to take the vote again? I will do so, thank you. I apologise. And some people are having a lot more fun than we are in here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so, we have the first proposal, which is to note the notice of motion. All those in favour of noting, please show. Popular position, clearly. Yeah. All those against? That's three. All those abstaining? Okay, right. So, um, and then... You're still confused. Well, that Abraham. Okay. Right. So we now put the proposal for the report to the vote. All those in favour of it being a report, please show. Okay. This is very odd. All those against. Okay. So both carried, Abraham. Well. <laughs> So it's starting well today. The two are not mutually exclusive. It's possible to note no, the report okay, and ask fine. for a report. I right. took it in, in that sense. So I think that as Thank the majority you. of members ask for a report, that is probably the fine. decision of the council. Okay. We have a report going on that. Thank you very much. We got through it in the end. Hopefully in the future you can look at me and listen at the same time, Gary, but thank you for your honesty. 
Right, so we now move to the main agenda, item 29, Treasury Management Policy <laughs> Statement. Catherine. Uh, this is our end of year report, um, which explains um, our Treasury Management activity over 2013-14 um, and sets out that we met um, and worked within all the parameters that had been set by full council. Um, it does also advise members of a new proposal from the local government associations, uh, uh, proposals to establish a municipal bonds agency. Um, at the moment, we are in conversations with the LGA to understand better um, how this might help us with our future borrowing requirements and also their request for local authorities up and down the country to become equity investors in that, um, which is an item that is dealt with separately um, on the TBM report. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sykes. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I just want to thank officers for this report. I'm glad that we're managing our money uh, prudently and beating benchmarks. Um, on the um, municipal bonds agency idea, I mean, I think, I think we should go forward with this. Clearly, it's, it's something that a lot of um, cities in, uh, in, in Europe do. It will give us a bit of independence from um, central government um, capital uh, finance sourcing and um, provide a bit of competition for the public loans board. So thanks again, and those are my okay. thoughts. Thank you. Councillor Norman. Thank you, Chair. Well, as usual, the Treasury management team has done a great job and has achieved all its targets as, as set out in paragraph 3.4. So we do thank them for that work, which, which seems to be um, very prudent every year. Um, we welcome in principle the LGA's new min municipal bond agency, which should give councils more options in terms of bor borrowing to fund new infrastructure and inject a bit more competition into the market. Now, I think the... Um, Director of Finance has, has given a bit more detail this afternoon. I was going to ask if she could do that. I've already had a briefing, but I, I, think, I think we have enough information now to be able to judge what it's all about. I've just got one question, and that is that the LGA has in this week just managed to raise the £400,000 required in order to set up the agency. So does that mean that our 50,000 will no longer be required or do you think it's still a, a, a prudent use of that money? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I met with the LGA's advisor on Tuesday this week to understand better their requirements. They have a minimum capital raising requirement um, in order to get the agency off the ground and they've confirmed this week that they have met the minimum. Um, however, they are seeking substantially greater equity investment um, than that uh, to enable the organisation to get off to a strong start, but also because they believe that it's a good opportunity for a wide range of local authorities to have a stake in the future organisation. Um, so while they might not necessarily need um, additional resources from individual authorities, their request um, is that they still are asking and hoping that many more authorities commit um, additional funding to that. Um, so I have a better understanding both of their requirements in, in the short and the longer term. Um, and what we need to do um, at the moment is to give them an indication of our interest and then we need to make a decision by September. And the report on the TBM, uh, Targeted man Budget Management, gives me authority in consultation with the leader uh, of the Chair of Pien Policy and Resources Committee and the opposition leaders to make that investment um, once we have some further information again over the coming weeks and they send us more formal documentation. So the purpose of the reports today is to ensure that the Council keeps its options open and it can make a choice one way or another because we don't have another decision-making meeting between now and the deadline to make a formal commitment. Actually, at, at conference, and I know Jason was there, um, it, it was announced that they had reached this funding. And as I understand it, some substantial size of county councils are back in this as well. So we're in very good company. And as Councillor Sykes said, I think it's, it is important that uh, local government is able to um, do more proactive things and not always having to rely on central government. So on that ground, I, I support this. Okay, thank you. Les? Thank you, Chairman. Just very quickly, I, obviously I agree with Councillor Norman in 3.4. Those four bullet points are all good indicators of the way that things are going. I just wanted to underline 3.15, where it said there, 
internal audit and business risk did carry out an audit of our treasury management function earlier this year and that it was able to give substantial assurance. And I think we can be confident that our treasury management team is working in an effective and good way for the council. Thank you. Bill. Just a very quick comment. Uh, they might care to look at their own pension funds to see if they can find funding in there to, to back local government works in the same manner as Canadian pension funds do, for instance, who invest heavily in utilities and public services in Britain at a time when we're not doing it. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Does the committee agree? Recommendations? Thank you very much. Right. Uh, targeted budget management two, which in layman's terms means how we're doing a month through the financial year. Catherine. Thank you. Um, so this report presents an early forecast on the Council's projected financial position at the year end. Um, it is month two and therefore we're making quite significant judgments at this stage of the financial year um, about what might happen for the remaining t uh, 10 months. But um, uh, it's my view that it is important to ensure that prompt information is provided to this committee on the best projections we have at this stage of the year so that we can take whatever necessary action um, we need to do. Um, so at the moment, I think members are aware that we are projecting a significant overspend, um, which is in total uh, £6 million. Um, however, we do have some corporate uh, risk provisions which can reduce that, and we're proposing that some of that is set aside um, straight away um, to offset the decision that this committee has already made not to further progress the local authority trading company for adult social care. There are further risk provisions available which can bring down this overspend further. Um, however, I think the challenge uh, to uh, us collectively is to bring down that overspend without having to need to call on those risk provisions because that is what will put us in the best financial position uh, for 2015-16 and not mean that we have to find additional savings over and above the budget gap that we've already identified. Um, members will be aware that um, there are significant pressures both in children's services um, on our looked after children budget in particular the independent foster agency placements and also on adult social care a combination um, of pressures on the community care budget and also some areas of planned financial savings um, that are not yet in progress um, so there are uh, a some key areas that we collectively need to be focusing on the next, uh, over the next few weeks and months in order to make sure that we're in the most sustainable financial position for next year. Um, at the moment, we're saying it's too early to provide an update on the collection fund performance, um, but we've got no reason to change our forecasts. Um, but we did set some quite challenging targets in terms of uh, both council tax base growth and business rate growth. But at the moment, we are, are hopeful that we will um, achieve those. Um, our performance on, on other areas, including the Housing Revenue Account and Dedicated Schools Grant, are also referred in here. And just to mention again that this is where we are making a request for the authority in relation to the Municipal Bonds Agency. And the reason it's here is because that equity stake in the Municipal Bonds Agency is classified as capital investment. Um, and therefore it needs to be treated as part of the council's capital program um, and that's because we cannot uh, undertake equity investments as part of our treasury management activity thank you thank you ollie as lead member uh, thank you chair thanks very much to officers for this uh, report uh, our projected overspend at pbm2 is um, unusually high and uh, clearly um, adds to the challenge for, for, the, for the authority in preparing for, in sort of looking forward to next year's budget. And uh, um, yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah we, we, we're, looking for, we're looking to a, a 25 million uh, gap for the 15-16 funding year. Hopefully, we're going to be able to, during the course of the year, reduce the projected overspend. But um, yeah, clearly, over the next couple of years, we've got enormous pressures from the areas uh, Catherine outlined um, in, in children, young people, and their out social care. And um, yeah, I mean, I'd just like to say that, that, that clearly there, there have been difficulties in implementing some of the savings over the last couple of years. And um, looking at the Argus headline yesterday and, and the story, I was, I was disappointed to see some of the comments from, uh, from opposition members because I, I think I've, I've sat here and members on the other side have voted against some of the savings proposals that we've put forward previously, which have you know, curtailed our ability to make savings, even when you're sort of supposedly ideologically opposed to yeah, you know, um, or, or you know, outsourcing and things like that. So, um, yeah, we, we've, we've, got, we've got a huge challenge um, ahead of us, and I think really we need to sort of work 
together this year and looking forward to 15-16 to, to try and address you know, the financial challenges that we face. Thank you. Councillor Norman. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, first of all, I would like to ask Councillor Sykes to, to name the savings proposals that he alleges we have voted against, but I will con... Oh, sorry. I don't think that's right. Anyway, I'll continue. Thank you, Chair. Um, once again, I, I want to thank our officers um, because forever they, they take their commitment to this council very seriously and there's a great deal of work gone into our financial reporting. But this report is extremely worrying. We become used to projected overspends in the first part of the year being turned around by the end of the financial year. But I just sense this year it's slightly different. And not just because the one million pound underspend has turned in a, into a projected six million pound overspend in the space of two months. On this side of the chamber, we were immediately struck by the unusually forthright comments of the section 151 officer in paragraph 6.1. For those people that don't have papers in front of them, she states that there is a significant level of forecast financial risk that must be urgently attended to. And this is something that, that has been spelled out to us in, in meetings that I've been attending for more than a year. So officers do accept that we must take steps to deal with this problem. And that in addition to that, the decision not to progress the local authority trading company for adult social care, there are other, because there are other savings included in the budget for adult social care which have been delayed or deferred. It is vital for both the immediate and long-term financial position that these are now progressed. The statements are very concerning indeed and I would like to ask Catherine further about it. We know that the trading company was not supported by the Green and Labour groups and so didn't proceed. Are you suggesting that this decision is now revisited as we would obviously welcome that? And please could you list what other savings are in the budget that have been delayed or deferred and the reasons why they've been put on hold? Um, I'm sure one of them was the outsourcing of some learning disability services. We on this side agree with Catherine that it's vital that these reforms now proceed. But I can't see how this is going to happen if they're constantly blocked. We've tried on numerous occasions at full council meetings and at this committee to, do, to get some agreement from the other two parties to look at proper market testing of council services and to learn lessons from how other councils are reforming, but they steadfastly refuse to back us. Part of the justification that was given for not proceeding with the trading company was that there were other greater and more immediate savings to be gained from commissioning, partnership and integration. Yet nowhere is this mentioned in the overspend mitigation strategies outlined in Appendix 1. Could you explain a bit more why that is? So as a result of all this, the percentage of value for money savings of this year that are uncertain are around 50%, which is as high as I can recall. So in our view, the overall picture is very worrying. Um, I've just got one specific question here, and it um, regards the temporary accommodation issue on page 53. I read recently that Labour-run Newham Council is setting up a local authority company to enter the private rented market building properties and buying properties from landlords who want to sell up. Homes are to be offered on six-month contracts at 80% of market rent. And this seemed to be quite an innovative idea to me, and I wondered if this is something that we could look at, consider, considering the number of landlords who are now selling up in Brighton Hope. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, I think it, it's, it's fair to reflect that the comments that I've made um, in this report about the seriousness of the financial position are stronger and starker than I have done in previous years at, the, at, at this time of the year. I think, think that, is, that is undeniable. Um, and you're also right to say that we have uh, managed to reduce early forecast overspends by a range of measures but certainly this is substantially higher in terms of overspend um, than any previous uh, forecast um, in my time as finance director here. So yes, I think it's fair to say that the scale of the challenge is significantly greater. Just to clarify my comments in relation to the savings in adult social care, um, I, I appreciate that some of the wording may be slightly ambiguous. I, I'm not recommending um, that we revisit the decision that has already been taken by this committee in relation to the local authority trading company. However, when we made that decision, we were clear that alternative proposals would need to be developed in order to ensure that the Council's long-term adult social care budget was sustainable. And there are other savings which are set out in the appendix, um, including in relation to day services um, and some of the learning disability options, where progress um, is not in line at the moment with the projections that we had originally set out. We've tried to be as clear as we can in the appendix, saying exactly which service areas uh, where the savings challenges are. I think there is um, some good news in the sense that there are a number of areas um, it, throughout the Council where challenging savings targets were set as part of the 2014-15 budget setting progress and they are on track. Um, but uh, undoubtedly our minds need to be particularly focused on the challenges in adult social care and children's social care. And you talked particularly about questions about uh, recommissioning of services. I think when we go on to the uh, corporate plan and budget preparation process, um, it is explicit in that report that part of the solution to the long-term financial challenges facing the, facing the organisation do include rethinking which services we commission um, and how we commission those. Okay. But, uh, sorry, I just want to continue that actually some of those are longer term decisions that take more planning and need to be thought about in a strategic context and therefore some of those would be diff difficult to implement in the, in the remaining months of this financial year and that's why you don't see some of the recovery plans in the current year explicitly dealing with that. But they will have to be part of the longer term solution to the Council's budget. Okay, and Jeff wants to come in on the accommodation. Yeah, I Thank I you, Chair. I just wanted to um, respond to Councillor Norman's ask, uh, question about um, working uh, in relation to private sector housing. Uh, strangely enough, um, I was on the telephone to DCLG just before I came to this meeting um, because the Council has had a, a very interesting history and innovative history about dealing with um, housing. They would like to meet with us in the next couple of weeks to have a seminar with us to discuss options. Thank you. Okay, Warren. Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, looking at the uh, overspend that's projected, um, I wouldn't want to play it down at all. Um, I do look at it in the context of, of, of last year, where we were looking at a, a two million overspend in, in December, and, and once the risk provisions that, that Catherine's talking about uh, are, are factored in, I think we're looking at 3.6, something like that. So. Um, it's perhaps not as, as huge. We're looking at a 1.85 uh, uh, million underspend uh, at PNR last month. So I think we're looking at it in that, that context. I was also going to quote the same paragraph as, as Councillor Norman did. Um, and whilst I agree with her on, on highlighting that, she would know uh, from the Health and Wellbeing Board that uh, I voiced very strong concerns about the withdrawal of the LATC report. Uh, we were not party. To, uh, to, to having it pulled at all. Uh, these are difficult discussions that we will need to have as an authority at some point. Whilst I don't agree with, with Councillor Norman and her colleagues about the solution to the issues in terms of market testing, which as we all know means straight out privatization, uh, we do agree that there are other solutions and, and other ways of service delivery that, that might need to be looked at. And we, we do as a party ask that these are looked at in a timely fashion and not delayed until after the election, which we feel is something that is, is increasingly happening. Um, 
I'd like to pick up just on one of the points on page 52 about uh, the underachievement of uh, parking revenue off street car parks because of uh, reduced income at the lanes car park due to the roadworks and the, uh, uh, the collapse uh, around uh, the, the seafront. Uh, I do want to use this opportunity to flag that up as, as something that's having a real detrimental effect on the, some of the businesses on the seafront and again ask that the mess that there is uh, in front of uh, the Little Bay restaurant where the area is fenced off, there are discarded cones, bent fencing, litter. It looks an absolute state. If we are stuck with that roadworks for whatever reason during the summer, can we please make it look a little more, more presentable? Because obviously it's having an impact on businesses. It's having an impact on our own income through the car parks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think Ian would like to respond on that particular point. Are you responding or are you getting in the queue for speaking? Okay, I'll have to put it in the queue then. Jeff, do you want to respond then? Uh, Councillor Morgan's raised this with me before and we will um, act on it. Okay, thank you. Geoffrey. Thank you very much. I just can't resist it just following on the comments from Councillor Morgan. But sometimes it sounds as if we're back in the 1970s. But on the question of detrimental <laughs> well, which effects... Which element? Could you clarify? On the question of detrimental effects... Going down to the city last night and seeing the rubbish strewn all around the streets, I really felt I was in a third world country. I was really quite ashamed. We're seeing lots of people out and just walking past masses and masses of overflowing bins and litter everywhere. If we're going to have another strike, why can't we get agency people in to actually do the town centre? It would be absolutely appalling. Um, but brings me Isn't on to... Isn't that illegal, Geoffrey? Sorry? Isn't that illegal? If it's I don't, a, I don't see why it is illegal. <laughs> I don't see what, what is illegal well, about you can't providing people agency people, legally people striking. in your city centre to empty your bins and stuff like that when they're overflowing. I don't know what our visitors must think. Anyway, anyway TB. Anyway, let me just move on, which brings me on nicely to page 60 in Appendix 1. And I have to say that given the high level of public funding that is already spent on trade union activity at this council, the highest, um, that certainly at one stage, probably still is amongst any unity authority in the country, I'm amazed that we're now getting an additional £73,000 is being spent on top of that. Now, can you please, perhaps the Director of Finance or someone can tell me how this has been allowed to happen in, in sort of month two, as it were, 73,000 overspend, and surely any full-time union activity would need to be signed off by senior managers due to the knock-on uh, impact on service delivery of effectively losing members of staff. Is there no central monitoring of how much of this activity is happening? And exactly why do we need additional full-time corporate release for trade union activity at this time? So perhaps someone could explain, you know, what, what we're actually going to do about this 73,000 overspend and how it came about. And shouldn't the trade unions themselves be funding this? Okay. Um, so just to be clear, this is an additional um, corporate release time over and above what was um, already being provided. However, that had been partly funded by the funding we'd set aside to implement uh, pay modernisation. Uh, that has come to an end, and therefore there is a gap between the currently agreed corporate release time and the amount of funding available. And you're right to say there are options there for us about negotiating a different level of corporate release time, seeking um, all, uh, additional union contributions, or deciding that actually that is the right level and that we need to increase our spend on that. And those conversations are ongoing at the moment. But as part of being transparent and clearly reporting where some of the budget pressures are, that is is um, uh, the key budget pressure in human resources at the moment that their budget is insufficient to pay for the, the existing level of corporate le release time that is a result of um, some, some long-term, long-standing arrangements. So these aren't new arrangements, they are long-standing arrangements for which the funding is low, no longer sufficient um, and therefore that is, a, that is something that we need to resolve. Okay. When we do, if I may just come back, and we actually compare ourselves to other councils, other much, much, much larger councils who spend a lot less of council taxpayers' money on trade union activity. Thank you. Okay. Ian? 
Thank you. I just wanted to point out one of the positives, which, which is the, uh, yeah, the underspend on parking of £370,000. And yet, yeah, despite the, the access difficulties to, to the, uh, the Lanes car park, which are caused mainly by the collapsed sewer, which was flooding the ship hotel and clearly absolutely had to be dealt with, yeah, despite that, um, yeah, car, park, yeah, car park revenue across the city is, is doing exceedingly well. And, and the car parks are proving popular, as, as uh, Councillor Theobald, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, can vouch having, having tried to get into the Norton Road car park a couple of weeks ago for a meeting and having to come in and said it was full and he couldn't possibly attend the meeting and had to leave urgently before his car was towed away. So, yeah, cl 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 <laughs> Well, 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 clearly all that promotional work that you've been doing, encouraging people to come there, has been working, Geoffrey. Uh, and, and, yeah, and, and as, as this report uh, yeah, lays out, yeah, the, the, the more and more people are coming to the city. The Brighton Festival, Brighton Fringe, and the Brighton Marathon have all reported record numbers. So, yeah, despite all the negativity from the other parties, yeah, the city is proving, continuing to prove exceedingly popular, and more people are coming here every single year by lots of different transport means. Okay, thank you. Alan, did you indicate, or was that? No, that was Les. That was Les. I apologise. I saw a pen writing. Les. Thank you, Chairman. I won't say much because a lot has been said already on this, but I think it's fair to say that we know that it is children's services and adult services that are under pressure, and in fact the overspend really is virtually based entirely on, the, on those two figures there. And children's services have been doing very well the last couple of years and coming in underneath, but I can, I can only assume there are additional pressures this year, which obviously and reflect the fact that they are at the moment over their, over their budgeted figure. So on children and adult services, about 5.5 million, I think, I'll just speak quickly. Um, which I like to see, keep on saying this, as you know, Chairman. That's roughly, I think, the amount of money we're losing in council tax that we don't get from student properties, about £5 million a year, which would be a great help in meeting our problems. Um, these things soon turn around. I think when we had our budget meeting, I think I'm right in saying at that time you were looking probably be around a £1 million overspend, and by the time we got the final figures, it was £1 million underspend. So there was a £2 million turnaround there in quite a short time. And, um, and I think looking at the figures here, when Councillor Norman said about one million, we were £1 million in hand and now we're £6 million over, but I think the £1 million was an actual outcome over a 12-month period. I don't think you can really compare that fairly with a six million pound figure predicted estimate over a two month period. And I'm confident that as the year goes by, but as in most years, that those figures will actually, will actually come down. I, think, I don't think we need to panic yet. I think there's plenty of time yet to see if these there's things plenty do. Plenty of time to panic, you say. Not panic, no, to be right. very watchful and very concerned, but I don't think at the moment mm -hmm. we need to panic too much, because I'm, I'm confident, that, I personally am confident that those figures will actually come down to more manageable levels. Thank you. Thank you. Warren? I was just going to come back on a comment to uh, Councillor Davey. If we are doing so well and, and, and income is up and, and car parks are doing brilliantly, does that mean that residents in my ward who have been waiting a very long time for some road safety measures while the 20 miles an hour scheme has been implemented can now expect some action on crossings and other things that they've been, been waiting for? We look forward to that conversation at the ETS committee. Um, I am slightly worried about the level of confidence that this is all going to come out in the wash at the end of the year, I have to say, because what we've been saying consistently, we've heard from officers and we've heard nationally, is that the level of pressure on particularly adult services but also children's services is growing and we've heard um, ADAS, the Association of um, Directors of Adult Social Services, we've heard the LGA's outgoing and incoming chair, so that's Conservative and Labour, all say we are at a crunch point. And while we would hope that recovery plans will take us some of the way to suggest that this will all come out in the Washington 12 time, I think is to, to miss the level of urgency and challenge that we face and that we um, as administration were very clear last year that social care was going to be under the greatest pressure and we have two parties here saying, well, it will probably be okay, but also are quick to um, oppose um, modest council tax increases each year of our administration which have helped um, ease that pressure and I imagine we might get a similar deba debate in a few minutes. Um, I think, you know, this council has millions of pounds less because we were not able to get those council tax increases in the past and we have continuing growing number of complex cases presenting in social services and there is no quick fix to stopping people presenting with eligible care needs. So I don't think we can suggest this will just come out in the wash of the recovery programme. Um, and in terms of learning from others, I think we always need to be learning and curious about what other councils are doing here and across the world. And I think things like the LGA conference are useful in hearing about that. But 
there is a lot of, of good work being done, and it's good to hear that DCLG and others are, are keen to see what we're doing here. Um, and we shouldn't undersell the, the many shared services we do and all those kinds of things. So we hope that there's good progress to be made on this, but I wouldn't want us to be overly confident and suggest that, you know what, in 12 months it'll probably be okay because it was last year. Because I do feel that we are actually in a different place to previous years and the pressures are more intense than we've, we've seen before. Anne. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd just like to say here, I mean, we're obviously all concerned and, and we're all interested in the financial situation that the Council has to deal with. But it's absolutely fair to say that the um, strategic, the di executive directors in adult care and children's care are, are absolutely first rate. They do everything they can to keep the services going. We do have a duty of care in the council, as we all know. So it, it is not easy. But I would like to appeal to colleagues to work with officers a bit more and, and do take their advice when, it, when it's offered, because in my experience, it's good advice. Thank you. Okay. I could just add, if the Director of Finance's speech that she made today had made it two years earlier, because so what she's saying is that what we've been saying for two years. And so when you keep your, your end, Jason, is, and Labour put the council tax up, ours is looking at the services and how they're delivered. And I'm delighted that the Director of Finance and what she's saying, I support them 100%. But, as she said today, you can't do it overnight. You, it will no. take you time. But had we started that two years ago, which is what we wanted, we'd be in a different position today. I just want to make that point. Thank you. Well, there have been significant transformations. You know, this building will be soon under scaffolding as part of that. Um, I think no one is suggesting that either one, I don't think it's reasonable to suggest either council tax increases or service transformation alone are going to bridge the gap that we face over the next four years. It needs a bit of both. That's what I would suggest. Okay, we have the recommendations before us, um, 2.1 to 2.8. Does the committee agree them? Agree. Thank you very much. Right, uh, item 32, budget and corporate plan preparation, Catherine. Thank you. Um, we, I have set out a slightly different approach to our planning for uh, the budget for next year. I think we've worked really hard over the last two years to join up um, our corporate planning process with our budget planning process, but I think there is more that we can do, uh, particularly recognising that we will come to the end of our existing corporate plan at the end of this financial year, and we need to refresh that and set a new corporate plan for the coming four years. And therefore, our budget thinking and our service and financial planning needs to be better joined up um, as we move into next year's budget setting process. Um, I think it's also really important that people understand that the central government deficit reduction measures are only about 50% complete, and that's both in terms of time scales and the value of expenditure reductions. And all financial projections suggest that um, the funding reductions in local government will continue until the end of this decade. Um, and that is probably irrespective um, of whatever the results of national government elections are next year and that is a very very strong challenge to local government up and down the country absolutely not a challenge we're facing on our own um, but we are only at early stages um, of the financial challenges we're facing um, this this report does set out the scale of the budget gap that we project um, for 2015-16. Obviously, that does depend on the choices that people make about council tax levels. And we have shown in this report both the gap with the projected, um, with the proposed 5.9% uh, council tax increase, which would be 21.2 million, um, and which would uh, obviously rise um, if we ended up with a council tax freeze. And we've also modelled that um, up to 25.4 million pounds. Um, and the further funding gap over the next four years is an additional 67.2 million pounds, and that is based on an assumed threshold uh, budget increase of, of 2% on council tax. Obviously, there are multiple options which we could model, um, but hopefully that gives people a sense of the scale and the ranges of the challenges that we're talking about. Um, obviously, we, I, I have drawn on the information from the TBM report. 
I think I, I would like to repeat again that some of the underlying pressures in children's and adult services, and particularly in adult services, were with us at the end of last financial year. And although we did deliver an, an underspend overall, the majority of what changed at the end of the financial year was one-off items rather than any change in the underlying financial position of our services. Um, and it's the underlying financial position and the sustainability of that which is the challenge that we need to face um, over next year and beyond. Um, we have particularly um, thought in here about how we will um, approach our budget consultation and there'll be ongoing conversations with the members budget review group about approaching that um, and trying again to engage with a range of stakeholders and the public about the challenges that we're facing and to try and have that conversation not just in terms of the budget but in terms of the priorities for the council and the city. Um, and uh, the proposal is that the timetable will be similar to what we've seen last year with uh, the first draft proposals coming to this committee in December for scrutiny, um, which I think most people agree had a very successful approach last year uh, prior to final decisions by Policy and Resources Committee and full council. Okay, thank you very much. Holly? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you again to officers for the report. A great deal of work has gone into this, and I'm particularly pleased about the, uh, the consultation process that we've um, outlined. So combining um, speaking to the public and, and, and residents in the city about the budget in, in parallel with the corporate plan, because the two are clearly um, closely, closely linked. And I mean, clearly this shows the, the pressure we're, gonna, we're, we're under going to the next, uh, next financial year. Um, and just to remind members, the, the 25 million budget gap is more than our combined spending on city parks, libraries, youth services, planning services, sports facilities, and child protection all put together. And uh, in addition to that, we're, we're losing £750,000 in local welfare provision, and we've got a 20% reduction in the education services grant, which amounts to about £800,000. So we're really looking at about a £27 million gap uh, next year. So. I think um, what we're proposing um, in this paper in terms of council tax rise is uh, eminently justifiable and, uh, and reasonable. 5.9% um, is, is a less than inflation council tax rise over the period of this administration. Um, just as an aside, it compares with an average rise over 10 years of Labour administration in Brighton over 8.3%. Uh, 5.9 won't solve all our problems, but it will contribute to meeting uh, the budget gap and raising the funding base in the future, which is also very important. Um, and on the acceptability to the wider public of a council tax rise, um, I draw your attention to a common raise poll, I think last week or the week before, which showed that the majority of, of, of those polled um, were in favour of tax rises for valued public services. That was about the NHS. Um, you know, you can equally apply it to sort of the, the services that the council provides. So, um, you know, a referendum could, could work for the city, and I, I ask other members that they support our, um, our, our council tax rise proposals um, and, and go to a referendum. I just want to say something briefly on opposition positions, because they're, you know, they're clear from the media and from the, um, and from the amendments that we have in front of us. Um, Conservatives want to freeze again. They've, they've given absolutely no indication um, beyond you know, a bit of privatisation market testing, which, which is no guarantee that would provide savings, how they would, um, you know, how they would provide savings beyond the 85 million that we found already in the past four years. Um, and, and as I said before, when, when we agree um, outsourcing and going to the independent sector in, in the budget, when it comes to the crunch in policy committees, um, you, your, your members vote against those proposals. Um, Labour want 2% and a fairness commission. How much, will, how much is this Fairness Commission going to cost us? I mean, how much is it going to cost to get the great and good of Brighton and Hove around the table in, in, in Brighton somewhere to put together a fairness report? We actually looked at this a couple of years ago, and we looked at other councils' experience of uh, fairness commissions and the outcomes of those fairness commissions and decided that, you know, these, these were talking shops. And in any case, we were already doing in our strategic partnerships and Brighton and Hove connected what, um, what this proposed fairness commission um, would do. Um, and there's a complete absence of a response from, uh, from the Labour group on the major issue of concern, which is the reduction of government funding to our city and, and the impact um, on the wider city. So 5.9% is right for our city. The poorest in the city are protected. Um, there's a good chance of referendum will succeed, um, especially if the Labour come to their senses. Okay, thank you very much. Anne, follow that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well um... You know, I was a bit uncertain about what to say before I started, but having listened to Councillor Sykes' optimism, and I must ask him once again if he could let me know, Councillor Sykes, 
which of the savings proposals my group has actually voted against. And if you can't do that now, perhaps you could do that later on. And don't shout at me, please. I, I don't mind having it later on. Um, what can we New Larchwood in January. Just New Larchwood. Yeah. Anyway. I don't recall that others. I will look into that. I don't actually. No, I'm not there. Anyway, um, what can we say about this proposal of a 5.9% increase in council tax for residents? Almost, but not quite, taking us back to the last Labour administration, which more than doubled the level of council tax residents paid at the same time as receiving increased grants from central government. We certainly don't think that we should be asking officers to, to waste their time preparing a 5.9% increase budget that has absolutely no chance of getting passed by full council, let alone the city's residents in a referendum. So we are putting forward an amendment today which Councillor Sykes has actually referred to. And I must say that I canvass in all areas of Brighton and Hove. I don't just stay in with Dean. And I believe that residents would expect the council to take that council tax freeze grant that is once again on offer. And I know Councillor Sykes said he'd like it to be 10 million and it's not 10 million. Um, our residents would like us to take the council tax freeze grant that's once again on offer from the government on an ongoing basis and prepare a budget on that basis. And, and um, colleagues have got the Conservative Group Amendment before them today in the name of Councillor Theobald and myself. Um, if my colleagues on the left complain about a lack of money from government, I could remind them that Hilary Benn has made it perfectly clear that there will be no new money for local government if they win the next election. That is also... That is also reiterated in paragraph 1.2 of the report. Indeed, we might actually get even less money because Ed Miliband has said that he wants to reprioritize funding away from London and the South East. We certainly support the proposed measures outlined in paragraphs 3.31, 3.31 and 3.32. Indeed, they are what we've been calling for for a long time but doubt very much that they can be delivered by the current administration, possibly backed by Labour. Um, Ooh, that hurt. <laughs> and on, on page 114, um, I just wonder how much new homes bonus funding are we receiving in total now from all the previous years of the, screen, of the, of the scheme which roll over? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Do we have an answer on the new homes bonus? Hand, I'm afraid I don't have it to hand. Um, it is something that's featured in the more detailed medium-term financial strategy, um, so I will make sure I pass that on. Okay, thank you. Warren. Thanks, Chair. Well, here we go again. Chair, I, I, I think, and I'm not breaching confidences here, I, I agreed uh, a while back that I was absolutely willing to work with you and with the administration constructively on some of the very, very difficult financial challenges this council faces. Um, not underplaying that at all, and that's not, uh, not at this stage to be, to be pointing fingers as to why we're in that, that, that difficult situation. Uh, I wanted to do that before we got into this highly politically charged debate over council tax, which, as you say, you know, whichever option we go for, it is not going to eradicate the problems that we, we face at all. It, 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 it's two, three million, four million, either way, which sounds a lot, but in the context of, what, 100, 120 million over five years, it, it, it's not huge. So I think there are other debates that we can have outside of this, but no. Instead of the previous budget, where we had uh, had all of these same debates, you know, Labour is voting with the Tories for austerity. The Tories say we're voting with the Greens to put council tax up. It's incredibly sterile. It's incredibly stale. It's incredibly boring for the public who are interested about uh, about their own uh, situation, their own living standards. So we're having the same debate, not for seven weeks like we did this past budget, but for seven months, 
before we know any, well, a lot of the financial information. We don't know if Eric Pickles is going to reduce the, the threshold from 2% to 1%. We don't know what kind of grants we're going to get through. There's an awful lot of information, an awful lot to come between now and when we sit in this chamber in seven months' time and, and vote on the budget. But no, we're going to have seven months of this kind of grandstanding from the Greens blaming us for the, the cuts, the grandstanding, the Tories blaming us for high taxes. And, uh, and, and yes, what, what's the answer? You know, pass on the tax, the, the, the cuts in, in council funding to people in the city. And what were we talking about not half an hour ago? We're talking about 3,000 people. Who are, who are using food banks because they can't afford to put food on the table. We're talking about 11,000 people who are in poverty, not because they're unemployed, they're in, in, in employment, but they're on low pay. And those are the people who are not going to feel any effects of council tax um, benefit from this, this council. They're going to have £100 more a year to pay if we approve this. So we do not agree that passing on the Conservative government cuts to local funding to the people who can least afford it in the city is a solution to this. That is not to say that we don't acknowledge the huge, huge challenges that, uh, that we face. Just to pick up on a couple of the points, the Fairness Commission would be met from existing policy and scrutiny budgets. Simple as that. It would be time limited. It would bring together all of the good work, which again I acknowledged earlier on, is already being done. It would look at what else can be done. Every one of the 15 authorities that has adopted the Fairness Commission approach has done it in a way that is unique to their own local authority. So we can do the same. If at the end of those 12 months it finds nothing, well, great, we've, we're on the right course. But if there's a chance of us finding more ways to, to adapt to the difficult financial circumstances that we as an authority and people in this city are in, then it would be worth the time and the effort put in. This charge that you know, a Labour government will make no difference. Ed Miliband was talking last week about decentralising, devolving a lot of the spend, a lot of the power down to, to local authorities. We do not yet know what that will be like, what that will actually deliver to us in concrete terms. More funding through the laps is, is I think, what they're talking about. We are not talking about increasing the overall envelope of government public spending. We're talking about reprioritizing it. So to say that there will be no more funding for local government is, again, seven or eight months premature at least. So obviously we are proposing once again uh, that we, we go for a threshold 2% budget. Obviously you're going for the same position as before. Obviously the Tories are sticking to a freeze. We are going to go through this whole pantomime, this whole charade for seven months this time. Really, I think we, we, we could do a lot better than this. Okay, well, but last year, Warren, you complained that you didn't get enough time to think about the council tax position. So this time we thought seven weeks, okay, not enough time, so seven months. You didn't have to come out within a day once again and say no. You could have thought to have a debate, think about it, discuss it with your party membership. Um, but you haven't, and neither have the Conservatives. So it's a little bit like you want it both ways. Um, but I will leave that to the public to decide. But I think it's important that, you know, we will have these different positions. We base them on facts. So the fact of the matter is that the poorest are more likely to depend on the services which are most at threat at the moment, um, and the very poorest, the 17,000 households, will benefit from the council tax reduction scheme. And it's also a fact that unlike um, the comments that one of your candidates made in the paper the other day, that Brighton and Hove has the highest council tax in the UK, we don't. It's just slightly above average. So we do need to ground the debate in fact if we're going to have a debate about this. And I think it's also important that we know that, yes, it's true, it's only a few million in difference between the 1%, 2%, 3%, but a freeze position does weak the value, weaken the value of the council's financial base permanently, and it means any future increases are worth less. So it's not a one-off quick fix. It's not an easy political win. It's actually making the council weaker forevermore, whatever choices future administrations choose to take on council tax. And I think... Yes, there may be a reprioritization, whichever government comes in, and both governments are currently, um, I'm quite enjoying watching them battle it over on their decentralization uh, claims. If any of that comes true after the election, even better. Um, but Hillary Benn has been very, very clear that the overall envelope wouldn't change. So the overall local government system would have no more money, it would move around. And call me cynical, but under a conservative-led government, we've seen more money flow to conservative-led areas. Um, in, in the leafy counties, and under a Labour-led one, we've seen more money go to the north, east and north 
um, northern cities. So where do you think it would go next time? I'm not sure. Um, We've also, you, we've heard you say before that, oh, Labour wouldn't support the MPPF. Well, just a week ago, we've had Labour saying they would have the MPPF. So time and time again, well, I've got, I've got a quote here. Hilary Benn, Sir Michael Lyons, Chair of the Labour Review, uh, 9th of July. You know, these quotes are out there. So you can't have it both ways. The fact is the cuts will carry on for councils, and we can't just sit here hoping that a general election is going to make it all sunny. We have to focus on a long-term solution to the pressures we're under, um, 18 million of the 25 million gap is because of cuts. The remainder is service pressures, and those service pressures are going to get even more intense. Um, yes, we've been here before in the sense that every year we have a debate on council tax. Don't we owe that to our citizens to have a debate? And they expect our parties to have different views. And I think, actually, our citizens uh, welcome the debate supported by the media outlets in the city over the last year. And I think more people are more informed about the pressures local governments are under. Um, so we owe it to them. But we also need to debate the other elements, not just the council tax. And this is what this report is mostly about. The council tax is just one element. Most of this report is saying, how are we as an authority with our partners going to engage on these issues and come up with long-term solutions? And I hope that we can spend more of our time discussing those as we move forward and just accept that we have some differences on the council tax. So um, I, I hope that's how we can move forward. I had Ollie then Ian to indicate any other indications. Okay, go on. Why not? Eh? Why not? <laughs> and Alan, okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I think Jason has said much of what I was going to say. I, I, I think you know, no other local authority is talking about next year's council tax at this point, and the fact that we are now can only be a positive thing. It's, it's a debate and a conversation with the city about not only the level of council tax rise or, or, or freeze, um, but, but about you know, the nature of the councils and the services that the, the council provides. So, I mean, I, I don't see how that can be seen as anything but, um, but, but positive. Just, just to come back to uh, Councillor Morgan's point about um, 11,000 in poverty and they'll be affected by the council tax rise. Um, 17,000 um, uh, residents in our, in, in, in our city get council tax reduction, so I mean, they, they will be assisted with, um, with, with that. And I just wanted to make the point that in, in the year 2000, I think we had about 9,500 uh, families in poverty in the city, and there was a council tax rise of 14%. Uh, percent. So um, you know, a bit, bit of a disconnect there, Councillor Morgan. But um, moving away from that, I, I do warmly welcome um, your, uh, your offer and proposal to work together on some of the difficult decisions um, we've got to make. Um, and I've, I've already met with... Councillor um, Hamilton to talk about um, budget matters and work very well with Councillor Norman. Um, we will continue to do so. So, you know, we can have the debate about the council tax rise, but please let's work on the, on the difficult, difficult decisions we've got to make, notwithstanding what level of council tax rise we have. Thank you. Ian? Thank, thank you. Well, this has been, been said by others, but yeah, we really do need to look further ahead than just now and, 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 and just this year. And, and it's been made perfectly clear by, by Hilary Benn that uh, yeah, he is going to carry on uh, the existing coalition government policy, including on council tax referendums. Uh, so all those waiting for the cavalry to come in in 2015 to save local government services, local services for, for local people who desperately need them in the form of a Labour government will be sorely disappointed should, should the, the, yeah, the country decide to vote one in. Um, yeah, and it, it, it does sound a bit rich, uh, you know, Councillor Morgan saying, yeah, he wants to work with us, but we hear no ideas and we know, hear no suggestions of anything positive. And he says that the government is going to direct more money to the local enterprise partnerships. Well, what use is that if the Labour councillors are going to turn down the money that we've worked hard for years and years to secure from the, the local enterprise partnership, such as the £8 million for Valley Gardens that we agreed at the Environment and Transport Sustainability Committee a week last Tuesday, I think it was, uh, and, uh, and evidence of what a good move that was, was on Monday we got an extra £6 million for Valley Gardens. So not only were the Labour councillors trying to refuse £8 million, you would have actually been refused using £14 million pounds and actually blowing the credibility of this local authority with that body. And as you say, that is the major funding source for all major projects in the future. So we, we have to maintain ourselves as a credible partner in that organization. And your approach so far has been doing exactly the opposite. 
and what really, it seems there's a real disconnect between one report and another. So we've had one report which highlights there's a six million pound deficit we are currently facing. Um, you know, last year, around the, the budget referendum, the budget discussion, we heard from the, the really vulnerable people in the city. The adults were learning disabilities. You know, who is caring for them? Who is shouting for them? I don't hear it from you people over there. And so you really try and connect things up. You, know, you can't just moan about budget deficits on one side and attempts to do something about it up the, at the other. Try and connect these two things together and actually come up with something positive to really help those people. Jeffrey. Yes, thank you. I think one of the advantages of going to conferences is you can actually uh, look and read and, and listen to what people, not only of your own party, but other parties say. And, and uh, the Shadow Secretary of State made it quite clear in his opening sentence um, that there would be no more money for local government if Labour were to win. And indeed, the only change he would make is he would, he would distribute it in a different way. I actually don't think that government ministers and even civil servants are actually capable of working out how to get, actually get down to the minutiae of moving it away, say, from Brighton and Hove and putting it somewhere else. I don't think they're capable of doing that. They might do it on a regional sort of basis, but I can certainly see stuff being pushed uh, to the northeast. And his policies are largely in line with this um, pamphlet, or, which has been produced by the leader of Manchester City Council, uh, and one or two others, the leader of Stevenage, and Councillor Morgan, you can, if you haven't got a copy, you can actually get a co uh, you can actually get it from the internet of exactly what he is proposing to do, which follows on uh, from those local council leaders, and you'll see there that there is no extra money, and they're trying to work on ways of actually doing things. Um, in, in a different sort of way, and the sort of thing actually that we're saying, and I'm very pleased, as I said earlier, that the Director of Finance is now looking at some of the ways in which we could uh, uh, run our services um, more efficiently and, uh, a, 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 and better. Um, as Councillor David said, we on this side will work with any party that comes forward with things which we think are in the, the Council's interest, and I think our record has shown that, that where we have you know, put our hand up and, and we have... Uh, accepted um, or, or agreed, you know, with the Green Party on certain major projects, and we will do that, and we will disagree with you. We happen to disagree with you on the 5.9%. We don't think it will ever happen. We think we're, you're doing it um, to sort of unite your group, as it were. We don't think it will happen. Um, I would just like to see officers producing a budget based on a freeze, um, we've already indicated that the actual difference at the end of the day, by the time you get the government grant, isn't so very much different to um, other suggestions. So that's why um, my amendment is here, uh, seconded by Councillor Norman, uh, that we should go for a council tax increase. And I can't, a freeze, I'm sorry, a council tax freeze, sorry, slip. Yes, we should go for a council tax freeze. Um, and uh, let's have that in front of us. Uh, well, I don't see the difficulty, and, and I'd hope that all parties would agree with that. Thank you. Okay. Alan? All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to say much, and I'm going to resist the temptation to bash the table a lot. And, uh, but I, I just wonder how the public must see this. I mean, they must look at us and think, well, we're like a bunch of puddings, mustn't they? We're going right back to what we was doing in February. Going well, and to say, you know, the council tax rise is just a small part of this report, and there's so much more in it that we hope we can all work on. I, I bet that would be the talk of the food bank. I can just see them all standing there saying, well, it's the council tax, of course, is only a very small part of this. There's a lot more in these reports. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's absolute blooming nonsense. I agree entirely with what um, Warren said. And, and for Ollie to say that, it just throw a comment in, people voted, said they'd be prepared to pay higher tax to save the NHS. It's an entirely different question, the NHS to the council. That you, you then say, um, and you could also apply this to the council services. Well, I bet if you went and said to a lot of people, are you prepared to pay higher taxes for council services, they, they, they'd say no. If you say it for the NHS, they say yes. Well, I feel uplifted by that. Um, I think we should make the argument that it is worth it. Council services are valuable. But anyway, Les. Thank you, Chair Miss. And I, as I'm second in the Labour Group Amendment, I felt I should say a few, word, a few words on this. I mean, 
it's, uh, it's been said there's about 17,000 people, I think, get council tax relief. Now, Household I'll ask a question in a moment, which um, Kevin can answer for us. If the council tax is frozen, or goes up by 2%, or goes up by 5.9%, are these 17,000 people still paying exactly the same, or if the rates council tax goes up, do they, in fact, have to pay a bit more even though they're on the scheme? Because the suggestion I've sort of gleaned is that you're saying that these 17,000 people won't pay any more money if it's a 5.9% increase than if it's a threshold increase. I'm just wondering if, if that's the case. But, but while I'm speaking on this, I may be wrong, but I've got that funny feeling that we've got three, three separate recommended budgets to draw up here, and I've got a funny feeling that they may none of them be passed. And so I'm just wondering what happens then. And when we're at the budget review group, I did say... I said, well, quite honestly, if it comes to it, I would rather have three budgets prepared than no budget prepared. So but we'll just see what happens. But, I, you know, I'm concerned that we're having this meeting here and Catherine's going to go away without any recommended budget to work at all. I will make sure we leave this difficult. meeting with a recommendation. But obviously, I do think, I mean, last year we had all this, as, as my colleague has said, we went yeah. through this last year, a freeze uh, of 4.75%. In the end, we came down to the middle of the road increase, which was the, which was the threshold. And um, I think we feel that was the right thing, and that's why we're suggesting the same thing should be done this time. Thank you. Okay. Catherine, you want to respond on the CTR? So, first of all, on, on council tax reduction, um, an individual's uh, liability is based on a percentage of the total council tax. So, at the moment, the minimum liability payment is 8.5% of whatever the council tax would be for that band. So, if the council tax increases, then a proportionate increase of that minimum liability is also passed on to those people who receive council tax reduction. Um, obviously, there are options for us to consider what is the right level of minimum liability uh, for council tax reduction, and we will be reviewing the scheme, as is mentioned in this report, um, and uh, options for, uh, for the, the whole of the scheme will come later in the year to this committee, um, but the way it works at the moment is it's a percentage of the overall liability. Uh, just in terms of uh, what happens if we end up with no recommendation, this is obviously something we have talked about at the budget review group meetings. Um, I mean, it, it, there, is, there will still be a recommendation in the report that requires budget proposals to be developed. Um, and um, as we have already discussed, there is um, between the, the government's threshold rise of 2%, and a 1% uh, rise plus a council tax freeze, we are only talking about a difference of a million pounds in terms of the preparation. So I think officers will have to work on the basis of, of, of thinking about how we can respond to multiple options for members. Obviously, that adds a layer of complexity to the budget setting process, um, but we are obliged to ensure that you have a range of proposals to consider in that context. Okay, thank you. Bill? Okay, right. Um, so we've got some amendments. I'm going to take them in the order they were submitted. So the first one is the Labour and Cooperative Group Amendment, um, which would um, amend 2.2. You should all have a copy. Um, amend recommendation 2.2 so that the option prepared by officers is based on a 2% increase in council tax, proposed by Councillor Morgan, seconded by Councillor Hamilton. Are you okay to go to a vote on that? Okay. All those in favour of the Labour and Cooperative Group Amendment for a 2% increase in council tax, please show. All those against, please show. Okay, that is lost. So then the second amendment we have is Conservative Group Amendment, which am amends recommendation 2.2 um, so that the budget is prepared based on the council tax freeze proposed by Councillor Geoffrey Theobald, seconded by Anne Norman. Are you okay to go to the vote? Right, so all those in favour of this, please show. All those against? Okay, right, that falls. So we now move to the main report as unamended. Um, and to um, assist with this, I propose we take the recommendations in parts. So um, first of all, I suggest that we vote on 2.1, recommendation 2.1, which is to note the projections and MTFS. Are we okay with taking it in parts? Yeah. Okay, all those in favor, we agreed with 2.1? Yeah. Yeah, just checking. <laughs> right, okay. Um, and then I want to take 2.3 to 2.6 as a block. Are we okay with that, with that as a block? Yep. 
Jeffrey and Warren, are you okay with 2.3 and 2.6 in the block? Okay, yes? Okay, so agreed, 2.3, 2.6? Um, yes? Okay, thank you. Right, so that leaves uh, recommendation 2.2. Um, so I'll go to a hand vote on this. All those in favour of 2.2, please show. All those against 2.2? Abstentions, none. So that falls. Okay. Right. So the, the, the head of law is proposing an alternative 2.2, which is instruct the executive leadership team to develop budget proposals for 2015-16 for submission to policy and resources committee for consideration, full stop, i.e. the first two lines of 2.2 in line with the comments from the Director of Finance. I think in line with the comments of the Director of Finance, as in there's not a great deal of difference between two of the positions around the threshold. Is that agreeable? Around the freeze to threshold. We're not going to specify because we don't have agreement. Well, I listened, Abraham. I thought I... I think ELT needs instructions from the Policy and Resources Committee. There was a recommendation that was put before you which was not supported and the two amendments also were rejected. Uh, that being the case, the suggestion is that if you were to amend paragraph 2.2 .2, so that it stops where it says consideration, it would be our instructing officers to come up with proposals and the Director of Finance, as she said earlier, we will take into account the wishes of the, the different political groups and officer uh, report will come back and I, I expect it will be prepared on the basis that it could form the basis for whatever uh, options um, the, 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 uh, the, the groups want in, but by way of a minimum amendment. The actual recommendation that comes into officers will have to follow custom and practice which is that you either follow the instructions of the policy and resources committee if there's an express instruction. In the absence of express instructions, I think the administration will probably have political and legal legitimacy to have their views sort of reflected, but that's something that the Director of Finance will have to take into account in deciding what specific recommendation to bring back to the Policy and Resources Committee. Les. Thank you, Chair. I'm a bit confused on this because if you, if you do to 2.2, two, two you strike the ELT to develop budget proposals for 2015-16, in 2.3, it says require budget proposals to be developed by ELT. So isn't that really saying the same thing? I can't really see why, why 2.3 doesn't cover what, in fact, has just been suggested for 2.2. So what I'm being told is 2.3 is just about aligning it with the corporate plan process. It's not a direction to create budget proposals per se. So if we could agree the first two lines of 2.2, um, just to explicitly instruct the development of budget proposals for 2015-16. So it doesn't really mean any more than 2.3, does it? So you can, you can no, so you're all right with it then, and then Abraham's just happy, and then we can all... Well, can see. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Gary? Gary? Uh, just for clarification, Chair, uh, through you to the Director of Finance, um, would she then be proposing to come forward with a budget which would try to reflect either... A, a, a corporate view on what's been discussed today, i.e. there's no agreement whatsoever, <laughs> and therefore, um, you know, sort of coming forward with a middle-of-the-road approach, or would she be presenting reports which would individually reflect all three viewpoints individually? Um, well, this was a challenge that I put to the group separately, um, knowing that we may well end up in this position um, and acknowledging that actually in the absence of clear instruction, that does mean that you are leaving some of those judgments to officers, which we therefore need to take. Um, what, um, if you are preparing a referendum budget, you have to also have a substitute budget at the threshold, and that is broadly equivalent to, um, and is likely to have some similarities to uh, what a 2% council tax uh, rise budget would look like. However, I am also very aware um, 
that uh, there is no consensus on any of those options and that uh, a legitimate third option has also been put forward in relation to a council tax freeze, which would also, um, which would only be approximately £1 million worth of uh, different proposals. So at this stage, it's too early for me to think actually exactly how a report would be constructed, but I will ask officers to work up proposals um, that enable all of those options to potentially be put forward and nearer the time, we will therefore have to think about how we construct a report in such a way as to enable decisions to be taken. And I think by aligning with the corporate plan process, what we're seeking to do is identify the needs that have to be addressed by the budget that way around. Geoffrey? Be put in the, in, the, in the minutes of our view what it should be. I think, well, you've got an amendment in the, yes. in the minutes. No, she's saying, but, well, no, I, want it, I, just, I don't yeah. want this. And the Treasury Funds is nodding our head. Yeah, so. and you've got the, both amendments are on the record as well. So yes. we've all, okay. So we've got an amended recommendation 2.2, and I'll read it just for clarity. Instruct the executive leadership team to develop budget proposals for 2015-16 for submission to Policy and Resources Committee for consideration. Full stop. All those in favour, please show. Consensus. What an achievement. Okay. Um, that report is completed and as amended has been agreed. Thank you very much. Um, item 34, annual performance update. And that's Catherine again. Um, so this report sets out um, our backward look on our success in achieving those performance indicators that we originally set out uh, to measure our corporate plan by. Um, we are, as part of our reinvigoration of our approach to performance management, trying to make sure that we have some really clear and consistent messages across the organization about why performance management matters. And we have made sure that we have included that in the front of this committee report, because I think it's um, a language and message um, that it would be great for members to champion as well. Um, and I think in the financial context we're facing, it's really important that we think of performance management not just about performance indicators, but it's also about priority setting, financial planning, and risk management, and how all of those integrate together. Um, hopefully, this is a, a clear report that highlights um, a significant number of areas where we have met or exceeded the targets, um, some areas um, where we were close to, um, but also is open and transparent about those areas where we have been off target and the reasons why. Some of those will be familiar to members, and indeed you will have had some uh, more thorough reporting on that, including, for example, on our approach to workforce equalities, which came to this previous meeting. Um, but I hope that presentationally it enables all members as well as officers to have a really clear understanding of, of where we're doing well, um, how we're doing in relation to other similar authorities, and to make sure that we focus on those clear areas for improvement. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you very much. Once again, I'm very grateful to, uh, to officers for this report, which is indeed uh, very clear and very useful. I think there is a lot to be uh, pleased with, um, and clearly there are issues of concern. It's worth noting that um, we've, we've, we're um, on about 83% in terms of green or amber, um, and, and it's also important to note that the, um, the, the trends in the majority of um, a, a, a performance indicators is, is, is up, so um, that, that's also good news. Um, the big issues, the exception reports are clear, and, and, uh, and yeah, we're aware of those. One of those is children in care, in care which is also reflected earlier in the TBM report. Um, refuse and recycling, nitrogen dioxide, and groundwater are three uh, area, environmental areas of concern, and we're aware of the issues, and we're um, addressing them. And I think that's one key thing that comes through in this report is that, you know, to emphasize the importance of, of understanding why we're um, off target when we are and being able to um, put in place measures to, to address that. And yeah, the, the big focus on performance is, runs through this and that's very important. Thanks. Thank you very much. Warren. Thanks, Chair. Uh, obviously, I'm going to comment on some of the red indicators, but I do want to comment on, first of all, on one of the green indicators. Um, which is uh, at the top of page 188, uh, proportion of children living in poverty, uh, target 20.1, result 19.6. Um, really, for 20% of children living in poverty in, in, in our city, in this country, the seventh richest 
country in the world. And, of course, we all know that in my ward, for example, that number is closer to, to 40, 45 percent. Uh, has really got to be an absolute shame on, on all of us. Um, then, of course, we'll move on to page 191, the red indicator percentage of household waste sent for reuse, recycling and composting. Uh, I was speaking to some colleagues from around the country yesterday and they are astonished uh, at this Green Administration's record on uh, recycling, um, really, uh, compared to other authorities to, to come up with excuses like, well, people are reading fewer newspapers. Well, you know, <laughs> recycling is going up in, in other parts of the country. Anyway, we'll, we'll skip that. Uh, I think residents will be quite skeptical uh, um, and, and quite concerned to see that the figures for missed refuse collections and missed recycling collections are not available. Well, um, we'll leave the public to, uh, to judge on that. Uh, moving on, uh, page 197, bar the number of webcasting views, we're not meeting any of our public involvement targets and the trend is getting worse. And I think we all ought to uh, look at the reasons for that and we'd, we'd like that investigated. Um, page uh, 201, uh, on the um, detailed statistics on the attainment gap between free school meal and non-free school meal pupils, we do seem to be in line with the national average in English but significantly below in maths. So I would like to ask, are there specific numeracy strategies being put in place to tackle that? Okay. Sorry? I'll do the maths one. Um, yes, um, obviously we've identified this as a real concern and for the past year we've been um, working with our head teachers on a maths project across the city. It's a city-wide project where there's been £150,000 of dedicated schools grant money on top of what schools get specifically for this project. Um, we've also got some secondments of good maths teachers from schools working with other schools to try and um, push things forward and actually share the good practice that's out there. There's also quite a lot of challenge going on for those schools that are not doing well enough in maths. And some of that challenge is around how they use their pupil premium for those children that are not doing well as others. So big project going on. And we're hoping this year that we will start to see some improvement in that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we've obviously got two large universities in the city and not knowing their syllabuses too well. I'm sure they do have maths courses. Do we work with them to, to do some mentoring, to have some crossover teacher training, any, any of that to try and help in that specific? Yeah, really good point. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. As part of the project and the steering group, the university are on that, and that is involved, actually, as working very closely with trainee teachers, but also specialists in the university around the teaching of maths. Thank you. Um, Anne. Thank you, Chair. Well, clearly there are some very encouraging performance figures included in the continued downward trend, uh, particularly in recorded crime in the city, reduction in alcohol-related crime, GCSE results, particularly in the city's two academy schools, and the standard of our early years childcare provision. And just to pick up on a point that uh, Councillor Morgan raised about getting uh, maths mentoring from our universities, that is well established, as I understand it, and it's very popular with teachers in our schools. So. That's a good um, addition. However, there, there does appear to be an increasing number of red performance areas, and, and Councillor Morgan again has mentioned some of those. Um, there's a few that seem quite worrying, the growing gap in GCSE performance between those children who do and don't receive free school meals, the number of looked after children, uh, recycling levels, and our continuing very high level of staff sickness absence. And although Councillor Morgan did, did, has raised this refuse and recycling already, I do wonder why you haven't included in here the number of missed refuse and recycling collections. I'm sure they're not just in Dean Ward. I'm sure they are pretty well general across the city. Um, on the staff sickness, um, are things improving at all? Um, we, we would hope, we, we have discussed this quite a few times before, and we've, been, we've got a benchmarking figure from 2011-12, which is now well over two years out of date. 
In line with national trends, I would imagine that it has decreased in the meantime. However, the latest figures show that the public sector averages 6.9 days per employee and is just 4.9 in the private sector. So I guess the question is why is our performance bucking national trends and increasing uh, what we are doing about trying to reduce that absence? And, and why are we setting a target which is not terribly ambitious? And, and I don't want to um, look as if I'm under, um, underestimating the, the difficulties of our staff who may be suffering from sickness. Um, that's not what we want. It's not what we would hope would be going on in the council we represent. Um, it's, it's just an inquiry about why that figure remains so high and what can we do if anything to to assist with that thank you chair thank you um jan wanted to come on the figures um thank you chair yeah i can i can respond uh to the question about why there are no uh figures in there in terms of missed bins um for the for the first nine months of the year um was obviously a very difficult period within the service um, and the reason why we didn't, why we don't have an accurate record of missed bins for that period is because um, if a whole street or a whole area was missed, we didn't then record all the individual properties because we had such high call volume. If we would have spent time recording all those individual ones, we simply wouldn't have, you know, the, the delays on the phones would have been more significant. So our priority at the time was to answer as many calls as we could and um, because of the, the scale of the disruption, we knew that there were areas that were missed. So, so in terms of getting the service back on track, there wasn't a lot of benefit to recording all the individual properties. The priority was to get those areas collected. Um, from January of this year, uh, the recording system is now working accurately, and, and we do, again, have, have accurate data um, that we will be publishing. Thank you. Catherine on the sickness. Um, I think I, I share... Councillor Norman's concerns, and I think we all do, mm. about the levels of staff, staff sickness. We have had a number of initiatives over time to uh, address this, and we haven't to date uh, been successful in having a major impact on that. Um, and you're right to say there, there are some other um, organisations who are doing better in their approach to management of sickness. Uh, we are putting an awful lot of time and effort um, at the moment into this. Um, it is too early to know whether it is making a difference, and I doubt if it will make a difference very quickly. Um, but uh, as an example, we are um, including um, additional training for managers to support them um, with uh, particularly difficult or challenging cases. Uh, we're making sure it's really important that everyone understands both employees and managers affected the importance of conducting things like return to work interviews and absence reviews and that those really must be taking place. Um, and we have talked uh, about this um, at all of our management team meetings and with the unions. So um, I will keep you updated on that. I think um, I'd like to reassure members that we do take it very seriously. Um, but some of the questions about why uh, we are facing different trends to those in other organisations, we are struggling to answer at the moment. Okay. Um, Ian. Um, I just wanted to give a bit of commentary to the air quality performance, really. So, uh, yeah, so, so those two indicators are, are, are red, but uh, it, it's kind of just a, a reflection of the situation which we've seen for, for the last decade or more in, 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 in the city. And uh, it just focuses on not two particular points. And, um, yeah, to, I just wanted to kind of say that behind this, there, there is a general trend of improvements. Yeah, air quality has improved in most places across the city in the last four years. Uh, and even in the last year, in the, in the Lewis Road, out of the six monitoring stations there, four of them have shown an improvement. So that's all positive. But, yeah, the real concern remains North Street. 
And, yeah, we, and it's, I'm really pleased that there's been cross-party support for the low emission zone, which uh, all going well will start there next year. And there's, and there's been some really fabulous partnership working with, with the bus company and also with Ricardo in Shoreham, who've, who've been doing some very, very detailed monitoring with the bus, bus company so they can really understand exactly the, yeah, which of their buses perform best and, and which perform worst in, the, in that area. And yeah, in, in last year, we were very successful in getting some money from the Clean Bus Technology Fund, I think it was, to retrofit a, a large number of their, their Euro 3 buses. Some their older buses with filters, and uh, we're working with the bus company on a, another uh, fund, which I think is called the Clean Vehicle Technology Fund or something like that, for some other new technology. And as I said, it's some really good work with Ricardo, so yeah, there's an acknowledgement that much needs to be done here, uh, but yeah, everybody is engaged with doing what we can. And in, in, in a way, it's, it's a victim of the popularity of the bus service in, in the city, and, the, the, and reflects the intensity of the use of North Street. And also, this physical work as well, so one of the things we agreed at the uh, ETS committee the other day was the North Street Works, which are, are very exciting. So that's uh, um, funded by the Royal Bank of Scotland, which will, will see, see some public realm and some transport improvements right down at the bottom of North Street. So all, the, all in all, the, you know, there, there's no one single solution, but all these things together will yeah, contribute to bringing an improvement in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Alan. Well, I was just going to ask a very quick question about allotments number of plots in the city, um, we seem to have fallen three short of the number of plots, but is that up on the original number of plots or? Oh, Quickly, sorry, it's let's on go page out and subdivide and we'll hit the target. Huh? Let's go out and subdivide a couple and we'll hit the target. Well, that's what I was, uh, that's what I was going to go on to ask. 193, it says, um, we seem to have done quite well because we've, we've somehow fallen three short on plots, but managed to get nearly 700 people off the waiting list. So, I don't know, is, 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 and, and are they full plots as well? Or? We may need to come back to you with a written response on that. Is that okay, Alan? Okay, thank you. Oh, go on then. Wow, very impressive. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I don't, um, in terms of the allotment waiting list, I, I think the, the number of plots has, has stayed the same, but the, the number of people on the waiting list has dropped significantly because we reviewed the waiting list um, and there were a lot of people on there who, who weren't actually interested. So, so the waiting list has come down and the length of time people are waiting for a plot has come down. Um, but I think overall the, the number of plots has stayed the same. Okay, and, and we, we are, as, as part of the strategy that was adopted, um, we are now offering choice of plots and we're working with uh, Vic from the Food Partnerships here, working closely with them on new initiatives like microplots to get people off the waiting list sooner. And, you know, we also know that not, not everyone wants a full plot. So there's a lot of work going on to, to speed up the, um, the, the, the length of time people spend on the waiting list. To reduce the length of time people yeah. spend on Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Good. Do we agree with the recommendations for this? Which is nice. Yeah. Thank you very much. Item 35, minimum buying standards for catering contracts, which is Catherine. Excellent. For variety. <laughs> Martin. Thank, thank you, Chair. Variety Act. Thank you. Um, this report seeks approval pro for proposed minimum buying standards for our catering contracts. Um, it's really about bringing together value for money um, with the business of being a responsible procurer. The standards themselves have been widely consulted on and approved by procurement officers and catering contract managers, and it's been absolutely vital uh, to involve these key people um, in that process. And as you'll see from the report, it's proposed that contracts valued over £75,000 be certified to a minimum bronze standard under the Food for Life Catering Mark Certification Scheme, which of course is overseen by the Soil Association. And it's proposed that contracts and catering spend under 75,000 should follow a set of standards equivalent to bronze um, food for life, um, but that the formal certification um, wouldn't be required because there's a cost associated with that too. Achieving the minimum standard of bronze food for life is expected to be absolutely um, cost neutral, and that's been a very important consideration um, in putting this work together. And caterers and contract holders are encouraged to progress from bronze um, upwards uh, towards silver as soon as possible. And you'll see from the report 
um, that our school meals and Brighton Centre contracts are expected to achieve silver, uh, to achieve this standard by winter uh, this year and uh, spring of next year. Um, it's really imperative when introducing this paper to acknowledge the work of the Food Partnership. As my colleague Jan indicated, um, Vic, who is the director of the Food Partnership, is, is here today, and indeed Chloe Clark, who is the Food Partnership project manager who's led this work. They've researched it, they've funded it, they've resourced it, and put it together with us in partnership, and we're very grateful for that. Um, the introduction of minimum standards is, of course, a key part of the Council's overall procurement strategy. Um, and it accords with the wider city food strategy. And if adopted, um, we would be the first council to adopt um, minimum standards across all catering contracts. Thank you very much. And my understanding is in schools that when we've done this, we've actually seen an increased take up of the meals as well. So it's kind of a, a win on many levels. Ollie. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I think this is a fantastic uh, piece of news. It's a really good, uh, good news story. Um, I'm, uh, Martin said it, but I'll say it again. I'm re really grateful to the sustainability team and to the Food Partnership for, for doing this work. It's, been, it's, it's taken some years to develop, I understand, to get to this point. So um, I really hope that, that um, opposition members can, uh, are, are on board with this, with this great um, step forward. Um, it, it, this is about more nutritious food. It's about knowing where your food comes from. It's about cooking from fresh. Um, page 225 has the full list of the minimum buying standards that we're, we're signing up for. It's quite but um, as, as, as Martin said, it, it doesn't add to cost. And if you look at some of the um, appendices on page 235, for example, um, some of the work that the Sussex Partnership NHS Foundation Trust have done has, has led to, to bills actually reducing significantly. So fruit and veg down by 20%, meat costs down by, by 10%, um, greater satisfaction with food, more food eaten, um, and, and also sort of local sourcing. So uh, there are benefits to the local economy as well. So I, I think this is an all-round good news story. Um, and I uh, commend it to the House. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Anne, what's your appetite for this? Oh. <laughs> I'm quite hungry for this one, Chair. <laughs> um, we, we, we support this uh, report, Chair. Um, the Food Partnership are doing such excellent work across the city to promote locally sourced, sustainable and healthy food. It's particularly important that the Council takes a lead on this through its contracts and supports local farmers and producers. My only question mark would have been whether the proposed standards increase the cost of the contracts. It's clear from the report and from other Councils that they don't. Um, I would just mention the hospital food notice and motion that we brought to Council last year as evidence of our support for this. I understand there could be some de slight developments on that front, but I'm hoping we would hear more um, in the fairly near future. But generally speaking, the Food Partnership are doing such good work here that we are very happy to support this report. Thank you. Thank you. Geoffrey? Actually, I think as Vic knows, I, I'm very enthusiastic for all this and um, sitting on Patcham High School governing body, we've just dispensed with the services of the contract and we're going to do it ourselves and hoping very much, certainly I'm hoping very much, it's going to be food which is coming in uh, from the local areas and it's always the first question if I do happen to be at a restaurant, you know, where do these things come from? Because the nearer it is, the, the, the better it is and it supports our local people as well. So yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sold on all this, very good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Does the committee agree with recommendations? Thank you very much. I'll resist any further puns. Shared Life Tender Contract, Denise. Thank you. Um, I'm stuck at this so I can speak to it. But Shared Life's contract, well, I think we've had a report here before, but this is um, in receipt of wanting to go out to tender to merge two current contracts. We have currently, as an authority, have two contracts with Grace Air Foundation in relation to the shared live service, which is a sort of adult placement service. Uh, one of those contracts, which is a block contract, is due to end in uh, March next year. Adult social care have a rolling contract, um, but it now makes sense to bring those two contracts together to get some efficiency within those. The, the, there has been, I know there's been some concern raised about how and while, while we're at, at uh, the position we're, we're at, as I say, one contract's due to end 
it makes sense to bring the two together. There has been a, a number of meetings and, and uh, a, a group meeting with shared lives providers over the last two years in respect of what we want to do. There's also some concern about what this means for the current service users within the schemes. I just wanted to reassure members that there will be no change to the carers, the carers providing support to these, these individuals. Um, they would remain the same. It would just be the management of that process uh, going forward that would actually change. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. And can you just clarify that there was someone from Grace there on that? meeting for two years? Yes. Okay. Geoffrey? Yeah. Um, I only received um, some emails on this subject from Sally Polinsky and from Eva Erickson from Grace Air, and I'm a great supporter of Grace Air. Um, one thing, one bullet point that's mentioned in her email, which a number of us have received, not just me, um, which sort of says here, um, Grace Air will be happy to take part in a procurement process for shared live service in Brighton and Hove as long as we could have some input into this. We will be happy for a tendering process based on a framework contract arrangement with a maximum number of providers. I mean, I just really want to, I know you're trying to reassure us, I just want to be reassured that, because uh, um, I think they do a fantastic job that, uh, that they're on board with all this as well. Uh, just a couple of yeah, things to add there. We have been having uh, conversations with their, uh, their deputy chief executive, and I'm not too sure where those conversations were at because David, who's been leading this, is currently on leave. In terms of the tender arrangements, I have checked with procurement, and yes, they could be involved in some consultation, uh, bearing in mind they are likely to be potential bidders to a level, and we were happily to facilitate that. I think there is... Um, some debate as to the, the, the nature of the contract that we will have. This is a very small service, so it might be that a framework contract wouldn't ap apply in this case. It would be quite costly to have a range of providers on that, but certainly we could have conversations with them and a consultation with them um, before that tender. And I, and I would also like to say we were quite disappointed because our staff work very closely with Grace Air on a number of other contracts. Um, so one, my, my lead commissioner has actually run um, Eva today and had a conversation with her and we'll be speaking to her again next week. Thank you. Anne? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think it's entirely right that this has been raised at, at Policy and Resources today because a, n a number of people do seem to be concerned um, now, whether that's a misunderstanding, um, I'm not sure. But having heard from the executive director, I am convinced that um, nothing is going to be pushed through and people are not going to be moved around without proper consultation. I think it's quite important to say that. We have heard the uh, director's um, confirmation of that today. Um, these sort of messages do come to us, as you know, and, and, and it's clear there is some level of concern in, the, in that community. But I, I'm pretty certain, in fact, I'm almost 100% certain that there will be further consultations, con conversations, and um, all will be resolved in, in a short time. Thank you. Well, I'm sure conversations have been happening, but it's perhaps not all of that community we're aware of the conversations and I know that efforts will be redoubled to try and encourage that the oil community are, are in there and it, just to be absolutely clear and you have said that and the director has said that existing placements continue as is this is about a procurement for new placements being set up and it's about bringing together two contracts rather than having two separate ones doing virtually the same thing so um, okay does the committee agree with the recommendations thank you Item 39, cash and transit contract, back to Catherine. Thank you. Uh, this just is uh, for information, recording the fact that um, I needed to use my urgency powers in consultation with the Chair of Policy and Resources Committee to urgently award a new cash in transit con uh, contract as a result of uh, concerns with our previous um, collectors, um, which we were unable to resolve satisfactorily. Um, during the time period that we were trying to resolve that, 
Um, I did uh, provide some, some confidential briefing to uh, some of the, the lead members on the audit committee to advise them of the serious situa situation um, and this report is to, to note the decision that was taken. Mm. I, th I mean just to say I mean I was I felt very fully briefed and consulted and obviously one would never wish these situations but they happen and I think that you know everything's been done to mitigate it as best as possible and I'm confident we'll continue um, on that basis and um, I guess um, it's uh, all encouraged us to think about more ways of being cashless, really, because picking up bits of money and moving it around is a pain, isn't it? So, Anne. Thank you, Chair. The actions that the Director of Finance has taken seem to be entirely justified, given the performance of the contractor. However, does it seem a little strange that the new contract is going to cost so much more? Um, like most of us, I thought we were supposed to be moving to more cashless payment services, such as paying parking charges by phone and card. I don't know if perhaps Catherine could explain why it's gone up quite so much. Thank you. Um, I, I think you're, it, it's fair to point out the differential between this new contract and the previous contract, and it's for that reason that uh, predominantly we chose the original contractor because they were offering a much more cost-effective deal um, than some other providers, and up until recently they had been offering a really high-quality, flexible service. However, uh, the risks to us of non-performance had grown so great um, that actually they were significantly outweighing um, the, the the, the reduction in cost on the contract. Um, I think the contract um, that we were previously in was uh, potentially uh, not, not sufficient for the uh, previous contractors to be able to be effective. Um, so I recognize that this is another budget pressure for us. Um, I, th this, is, this does appear to be the most, the best value for money of other available contractors, and there are others who are more expensive. But I think you're right. We do have a very significant operation for people to collect cash from. Um, and uh, for as long as we have a significant amount of cash through our on-street parking, um, there will be a significant cost associated with collecting that. I mean, it is worth noting that when we have discussed more cash, people have always expressed caution because some people still carry cash and so we've not been as aggressive as other places like Westminster in eliminating cash machines and so perhaps when we're looking at this in future we need to bear in mind the cash collection costs as part of those conversations because it sits somewhere else in our reporting um, so because I think moving forward there are benefits to be had. Um, okay so does the committee agree the recommendations to note the actions taken? Thank you. Um, right, item 40, Hove Town Hall, South End Office Option. Catherine. Thank you. Um, members have had uh, several re reports um, over the last couple of years about work styles, um, and the last report that came here uh, set aside as part of the proposals to dispose of King's House and refurbish Hove Town Hall, a uh, proposition that um, a third of Hove Town Hall um, would be uh, effectively leased, long leased for commercial operations. Um, as part of the ongoing review of the business case and to make sure that um, we have got the best option, uh, we have revised our proposals for that third of the Hove, of Hove Town Hall that is uh, surplus to our accommodation needs. Um, we've been working alongside, in particular, the Com Clinical Commissioning Group for the city, um, who are in uh, leased accommodation that is expensive in the centre of the city and uh, would wish to find an alternative accommodation um, and I think it is both organisations' preference that wherever possible we can support closer integrated working. Um, we're also aware of a number of other organisations in, uh, in the city, including, for example, some of the advice agencies who are also struggling to find premises. Um, so our view is that it would be the most cost-effective uh, uh, approach to the refurbishment of Hove Town Hall for us to take on ourselves. Um, that responsibility alongside the other works that we're doing to Hove Town Hall um, and then seek to let those remaining premises. Um, 
although uh, we've had really constructive conversations with um, the CCG and other agencies, um, I think it's important to note that we don't have contractual binding commitments to the use of that accommodation, and so there are some risks associated with that. However, we have made sure that when we have modelled the business case, um, that we can cope with um, occupancy uh, as low as 60% um, in order to assure ourselves that um, we can cope if some of those commitments don't follow through. So uh, I think this works um, better uh, in terms of the use of this as a public service hub for the city, supports integrated working, and also is a, a financially better option for us than that that was previously put forward um, as a use for this site um, where it exceeds our requirements for office space. Yeah. And I think public service hubs is a model that a lot of people are looking at. The fact that we have the opportunity to do this now is, is quite potentially exciting for the, the co-working. Jeffrey, oh, um, you've got a better deal on the table. Well, well, um, I don't object, and certainly it's quite sensible to co-locate with the organisation you've just mentioned, but we still remain to be convinced that Hove Town Hall is the correct place to do it. Um, and I still think, and I repeat it, that a lot of people would find it, you know, surprising. Well, they will agree with disposing of King's House. We certainly agree with that uh, as soon as possible. That's the right option. But then in spending the entire proceeds, plus five million more, on refurbishing another council office a few hundred yards up the road would strike many people as a bit odd, to say the least. Um, what I do... And I, I know I've had a response on this, but I, uh, I did suddenly find out that Sussex House, the, um, which the police, Sussex police occupy at Hollingbury, is going to come back to us. Um, I, I didn't know that, but uh, uh, I found this out. And it just seemed to me that there is a building is going to come back to us anyway. Um, that might have been a better bet to have put some of our staff in uh, for us to use rather than Hove Town Hall in an expensive location, which would have been a really good location, you know, for housing or schools or something like that. So I, I really, uh, I know Angela has responded to me, which I thank her very much when I queried this straight away, when I heard this, but I, I still remain to be convinced that we're doing the right thing, moving from just there to there and costing a lot of money to do it. Okay, Warren? Thanks, Chair. Um, difficult decisions on property and uh, deciding where the council should move to and whether it should be accessible, whether it should move out of town. Uh, I think at, one, at some point we as an authority had to make a decision and we made that decision and it's, I think, puzzling that we keep revisiting that decision. Uh, once we've made it, we've got to make it work, um, as, as we've said on, on other projects. Um, absolutely support the idea of, of, of co-location of services being in the same same place more accessible to people more integrated working all of that kind of thing um, thinking along the lines of organizations that we give grants to and it's difficult in the current circumstances to sustain those grants to organizations whether the relationship between grants which they may well spend predominantly on rents uh, whether there's a relationship between this building and those organizations that we could examine may not work out, but at least we've, we've looked at it. Okay, thank you. Gary? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm sorry I'm going to sp possibly speak in not direct opposition, but uh, it, actually against that, that sentiment, because I, I was going to ask, uh, within the report on page 263, we had paragraph 1.2, where delegated authority had been granted, 1.3 outlines alternate proposals. Uh, would I be right in saying that the conditions appertaining to 1.2 would actually relate to the works and accommodation and potential tenants outlined and under 1.3? I'm slightly struggling to understand the question, but maybe if I can explain the reason why we needed to come back to this committee. So while authority was granted to me to do the engagement and communications on the works, including dealing with this space, um, 
what, it, uh, what this proposal requires is the Council to commit additional capital investment itself and to commit additional borrowing, and that was not within the scope of the original delegated powers given to me, um, and therefore that's the reason why this needed to come back to this committee to ensure that there was agreement that effectively the Council was... Uh, previously, we had assumed that any other third party would do that development and refurbishment and incur those costs themselves. The, the change is that we are proposing to do that ourselves instead, and therefore that wasn't within the terms of the authority that I originally had, hence bringing it back here. But I'm not sure whether that's exactly the question that was asked. Uh, no, it wasn't, but it's, it, it's a super answer, and I wish I'd thought of the question. <laughs> no, I, I think really that, what, okay, what, what, what I was going question? to say was, in fact, that we are talking about potential inter-service users, which I think is absolutely brilliant. But am I right in assuming that from a commercial point of view, and this is what we are doing, from a commercial point of view, those offices would be let on normal commercial terms? I think that's really what I was getting to. Okay, and we got nods. Yes, so we are assuming that they would be let on normal commercial rents, and we have benchmarked um, the affordability and the sort of market comparisons of those rents to ensure that, for example, if the CCG and other advice agencies perhaps weren't interested, that we would be able to, that it would still represent a competitive price for office space in the market. If we went down the route potentially suggested by Councillor Morgan, where we might want to consider um, the different uh, methods by which we could support voluntary organisations, um, we within this proposal do need a rental income stream to support the costs um, and that would be a, a different decision for us to take which undoubtedly is something that is open to us but the assumption here is that we would be letting out at a, a, at a reasonable market rent. Okay, Bill? Um, I just wanted to reassure Warren that there have been discussions going on with advice agencies and others from the third sector about I think Angela has spent quite a lot of time looking at the list of our buildings and what can be done to help. Um, okay. Um, well, I do think the, the, the possibilities there are really very positive. And, um, I, if well, we had an agreement with the CCG, would it be possible for them to put some capital into the, in doing the works? Um, CCGs find it do not have an easy route to access capital. Um, and the way that NHS finances work mean that it is very hard for them to access capital. However, what we do know is that they are currently in a, uh, a what, what is a comparatively expensive lease arrangement um, and that this would represent um, a, a mm. more cost-effective option mm. for us. Which, to be fair to them, they inherited that. They inherited a, yeah. don't so, had any, yeah. a very limited choice about what yeah. to do about that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And I do agree with uh, Councillor Morgan that we need to just move forward with this. The decision has been taken. Hove Town Hall is where we're investing and we're developing, so let's make the best of, of it and um, hopefully bring as many partners here as possible. And I think the par partnership with the police here is already very positive. So we have the recommendations before us. Um, does the committee agree? No? Okay. okay. Is that just you, Geoffrey, or all three of you? Okay. All right. Thank you, that's agreed. So item 41, Port Slade Support Centre Future Management Arrangements. I've got Pinnocky or Paula to introduce it, neither of which are here, so Joe. <laughs> Hi, Hi, sorry, it's Joe today. Um, this is a joint report between uh, Leisure Services and Children's, and basically the report sets out the options for the future management arrangements for Port Slade Sports Centre and seeks approval to indicate a procurement process to seek the, an external operator to manage the centre. Um, the Port Slade Centre is dual use. It provides sports facilities for the school and also the community and is on the Port Slade Aldridge Academy school site. Um, the recommendations that are put forward are, are following a lot of joint work with the school themselves, the sports centre site and the Aldridge Foundation Academy. Um, you'll see that um, the sports centre itself, although it's used um, a lot, it's 40 years old and needs considerable investment in order to get up to modern standards. 
Um, a number of options were looked at uh, with the school and the Academy Foundation, and the option that's put forward here is seen to have the most benefits and actually put us in line with the Council's strategy for management and development of the six other community sports facilities in the city. Um, the soft market testing has taken place and informal discussions have taken place with six different operators. Um, we've got Michael and Toby here who've been very much involved in the detail work and they're also here available to ask any, answer any questions if you've got any detailed things okay. that you need to ask. Thank, Thank you. I've got Bill. Les? Was it hoping Les? Bill? Um, well, I just hope that as with the other sports facilities we have, we'd be looking at the possibility of third sector uh, providers, not for profit. I think they were in the list of those being engaged, definitely. Les? <clears throat> yes, I mean, obviously, I, you know, one has to look at the situation that we're currently in. It's obvious that the, whereas PCC, the community college, could run the sports centre and various other facilities, the village centre, the youth service and so on. Uh, the Aldridge Academy is really strictly an educational body full stop, it seems to me. And so this, something's got to be done about this situation. And I read this through here, and obviously it does seem to me option two is uh, ruled out anyway by the, uh, the academy. Number one, I don't think we now have a setup to run sports facilities because all the others are in the hands of um, private companies. My only concern, as you might imagine, is with regard to the fees and charges. I'm just wondering, and I don't have enough experience of the other ones in the city to know whether the charges at Port Slade at the moment are comparable to the other ones or whether they are a lot cheaper or what the situation is. It does say in the report on page 271, the council would reserve the right to approve fees and charges, as is the case with other council sports facilities. Uh, reserving the right isn't quite the same thing as saying that they actually say what the charges are. I'm just wondering how that actually works. But if there's any... But he can give us any idea as to yeah. what the charges are like at Port Slade and how they compare with others. I think that would be something which would be quite useful for me to know because no doubt people will say to me, that's going to be a big increase in charges. That's okay. what the first thing the public will say. So All any right. advice on that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Can Toby? In terms of the level of charges that are there at the moment, yes, they are comparable with other, other sites. Um, all sites differ to a certain extent in terms of the, the quality of the facilities and therefore the prices do fluctuate slightly, but they're broadly in line. In terms of the, um, uh, the protection or the over, over price increases, uh, there's a, a mechanism that works within the current leisure management contract that we have with Freedom Leisure, whereby uh, prices are protected and are only able to rise in line with inflation. Um, and uh, anything, any proposals that are above inflation have to come to committee and get council approval for. So that's the protection that's within the contract currently with, with Freedom Leisure. We would be looking to introduce the same mechanism within this contract. Okay. Alan, were you indicating? Go on, then. Uh, I mean, I was, I was only going to say that um, Port Slade Sports Centre has a big place in my heart. It was... Um, it was built the year I left school, so just as I was about to leave school there at PCC, so the sports centre was, was built. And it was the scene of some of my greatest triumphs when I was the best uncapped striker in the country. Um, <laughs> but that, that being said, it, it, it's obviously fallen, um, fallen behind. And I, I was surprised to learn this week that it doesn't even have a computerised booking system. Everything's still done on bits of paper and stuck in a, in a drawer if you want to book there. So it, it seems obviously to, to me that stuff does need doing up there and um, it is a great facility. It, it, the, the football facilities up there, the two indoor pitches and the outdoor pitches are probably second to none in the city. So it, um, it, it, it's really something that needs investment and it looks as if option two is the way forward and the, the way to get... Uh, is it option, option two? Three, option think. three. Well, option two would have been all right as well, but option three <laughs> is the way forward. Okay. okay. Thank you. I look forward to hearing more about your footballing career at future meetings. Gary. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I, I'm just trying to understand the recommendations. Could I ask, is the citywide sports facility contract at present uh, runs out on the 1st of April 2021? Yes, that's correct. That being the case, Chairman, I'm, I'm worrying, I, I, I'm trying to understand recommendation 2.2, little 2. 
insofar we're saying talking of granting an extension, should it be required in order to be coterminous with a city-wide sports facilities contract? I, I guess it means so that if you want to re renegotiate the city-wide contract, um, you would then invoke that. So am I right in saying if that is the case, that 2.2 could be invoked any time during the, f the, the actual six-year period of the initial contract? Sorry, just to clarify, the existing contract with, with Freedom Leisure is a 10-year contract which, which runs until the 20, 2021. Uh, there is an option to extend for a period of up to five years as part of that contract. So whilst it's a 10-year contract, there is an option to extend. Hence the reason for, for recommendation 2.22, which was to uh, do the same with this contract in order that it's coterminous. Chairman, I accept that. Um, it's perfect. It, the, the, the writer knows exactly what he or she means, but when you're reading it, it didn't totally make sense, but I totally accept the explanation. Excellent. Good. Glad to hear it. Um, right. So, does the committee agree the recommendations? Thank you very much. Um, now, we've got uh, 42 Stanley Park Master Plan, which is a part two item. So, could we just do 44 briefly, and then we can manage our part one and part twos more easily? 44 is appointment to the fire authority. Um, uh, so, the committee requested to appoint a representative to the fire authority following Councillor Rufus's resignation. The appointment currently falls to the Green Group, and Councillor Lizzie Dean has been nominated. Does the committee agree the nomination? Thank you. So we now go to Stammer Park Master Plan, um, Part 1 report. Jeff. Thank you, Chair. Um, this may be a two-hander between myself and Jan. Uh, Stammer Estate in the park is a, a wonderful asset for the city. I'm sure members would agree. Um, but it does need a, a significant injection of... Um, funding, uh, particularly into the estate, the home buildings, the house and buildings, and the park. And I'd, I would anticipate, given our discussions on budget earlier, that members will um, probably agree that we, that's not something we can afford on our own. So what we are proposing in this report is to draw up a heritage lottery bid um, with our partners. Um, the um, Resources um, that the resources that we've uh, detailed in the bid, and we're not asking you to commit that capital funding at this stage. We will be coming back at stage two. Uh, that will be a point at which you will then be making um, firmer decisions about um, what funding the council needs to put in place. And that said, there are some um, proposals in the part two report which will help us move towards securing some of the finances for the um, part two stage. Um, the, um, I think the proposal is um, important in a number of ways. I think it's a, a signature project in terms of our UNESCO biosphere designation. It starts to bring that to life. Um, I also think it's important in that it is a deliverable bid. It is financially feasible if we do get the funding from Heritage, uh, the Heritage Lottery Fund. And it, we are, the funding gap that we've currently d identified, which is in hundreds of thousands of pounds rather than millions of pounds, um, I think really emphasizes that it is a deliverable bid. Uh, Jan has also set out the timetable in section nine, and I'll just ask him if you'd like to add anything else. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, this is a, a joint report between Environment Development and Housing and Finance and Resources, and my team have worked closely with Angela's team on this. Um, I'm, I don't know how much I mean, members are obviously very familiar with the background. So um, in terms of the park itself, uh, Stan Park's got significant potential, but some of the issues are that there is no coherent management plan for the park. Key uh, parts of the estate are falling into disrepair, and parts of the park are on the uh, English Heritage at Risk Register. We've got a number of uh, listed buildings in the park that are also at risk, and there are also significant traffic and transport issues in the park. Uh, back in April 2012, uh, Cabinet agreed proposals to carry out development appraisal for Home Farm, which is the, ma the main farm complex in the park, and um, noted that work had commenced on the master plan for Stanmore Park. The project has really gained momentum um, over the last seven months. Uh, the master plan has almost been completed. It has been costed. Uh, a funding strategy has been developed consultations being completed, and um, uh, the, the project board 
uh, has continued to meet and a member board has also been established to oversee the governance of the project. And we've met with the Heritage Lottery Fund who are very interested in the project and who are supportive of the approach that we're taking with the project. Um, the key elements of the master plan are the restoration of the parkland, the restoration of home farm, and the restoration of the, the walled garden and nursery in the park. Other aspects are, uh, as I've said, addressing parking and traffic. Um, within the, the heart of Stammer Park, we've got the City Parks Operational Depot, and as the project de developed, it's really become apparent that restoring the park with a heritage grant won't be successful if that very operational, quite industrial activity stays um, in the center of the park and it's become apparent that for our bid to be successful, we need to move those activities out. That is one of the key risks or one of the key issues for the project, because while the HLF will fund making good that land and restoring it, it won't fund um, a, a new site. So uh, one of the recommendations in this report is that uh, this committee authorizes officers to continue to look at alternative sites and funding arrangements for um, city parks operations. Obviously, we are looking at co-locating and other sites for those bits uh, of the depot that can be co-located. Um, traffic and parking is a key issue. Parking is uncontrolled. Uh, we have uh, significant amounts of parking from the university. We have problems with the bus getting through the park. So, you know, th things are um, accumulating in that sense. And what we propose to do is... Um, progress the, the, a, a detailed parking consultation early next year once we have the outcome of the uh, Stage 1 HLF bids if this committee um, agrees the recommendations. Um, briefly, in terms of the costs, uh, the master plan has been costed in detail and the overall cost is £12 million. Um, of that, £7.5 roughly £7.5 million is capital. Uh, £600,000 would be for the, development, uh, for the development phase of the project. Um, so getting it through to the final application. And about £800,000 would be for activities, community engagement. And I think one of the key issues is that the heritage grants that we're going for aren't just for capital. And we have to do a lot of work on community engagement, interpretation, um, and activities in the park. And we also, what well, the other critical issue is that we need to demonstrate that we've got a financially sustainable management plan for the future so we don't invest all this money in the park and then we can't maintain it. Um, the, we're proposing uh, applying for two funding bids, one Parks for People bid to, to do the restoration work on the park itself and the walled garden and a second heritage bid uh, which would do the work required on home farm. Um, the split for both bids would be 75% grant, 25% match funding, and the, uh, the match funding requirements are set out on page 279 of the report. Um, the uh, match funding that we'd be looking for from the council would be in the order of 2.6 million with 340,000 pounds from um, other organizations. And um, in terms of uh, where the, the match funding from the council would come from. The, the detail will be discussed in the part two report, um, but the sources that we've identified are 50% of capital receipts from disposal of non-core assets, identified from the agricultural portfolio, 100% um, of the capital receipts from the disposal of a vacant plot in the park, which could be developed for, for residential use, and prudential borrowing uh, based on the income from the home farm complex once it's been put back into economic use. I think that's a quick run through the project where we are. I'm um, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. And I think also worth mentioning the National Park Authority, who are key partners in this, and this is one of their gateways into the park, and they continue to be committed to having a base there of, of some staff. So it's really important bit of partnership working. Ollie, I saw a nod from you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, just very briefly, and I think this is very, very exciting. I think it's quite an extraordinary site up at Stanmo, when, when I can drag myself away from Palmyra Square, I seem to be going up there quite a lot, and uh, just, just the, 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 the amount of heritage assets up there, 26 listed, 29 listed buildings and four scheduled monuments, um, everything from medieval sites to sort of 1950s cherry orchards commemorating the coronation of the Queen, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
And, and yeah, the, the huge potential gateway to the National Park and the, the headquarters for the uh, headquarters or an office for the South Downs uh, National Park Authority. Um, I, mean, I think this, this looks to me like a, um, a very robust plan. Clearly, there's still the question of where the, uh, the city parks um, depot would, would go, but um, you know, that will be resolved, I hope. Um, and also, sort of very keen interest from the Heritage Lottery Fund. So, I think it's extremely um, positive. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Jeffrey. Yes, um, thank you very much for this. Certainly, um, I welcome um, the, the, the plans to try and improve um, the area. As has already been said, there are a lot of heritage buildings there. Um, many of them need a lot of tender living care. Um, the, the, the old barn, um, is, that, is that included w within the home far building? So you, you're referring to that there? Because it, I, I, I thought this, the South Downs National Park might have gone into that barn, but, you, but then I think you told me they, they're not going to. Um, hang on. Try again. Uh, the, the Long Barn is, is the key building of the home farm complex, and um, we are we're working very closely with National Park. They're on the project board as well, um, and they want to be part of the complex somewhere, but I think it's recognized by everyone that um, home far, the the Long Barn has the most potential to, to generate income. Um, so it's likely that the National Park would go into one of the other buildings, but all that detail will be worked up as part of stage two. And uh, as I've said, we're working with the National Park on that. Absolutely delighted to hear that that's the building you think has the best potential for income because it's such an enormous structure and uh, the council over many years has wondered what to do with it. So I'm. Um, very pleased to hear that. Um, I, I did read somewhere that there was some concern from uh, maybe it's the villagers over the, the sort of car parking arrangement uh, as to um, uh, in, in their homes at that end. Um, what, what, what? I mean, one of the big you, the one there's one glaring omission from this report, and of course, which is. Um, travellers who are constantly on this park. I mean, has any thought been given to how you somehow or other sort of design this out or how you help the situation there? Because, Build you know, there's, the, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's lots of comments about cars and people parking their cars. There are all sorts of things, but there's no reference to this whatsoever. And I just wondered what thought has been given in that direction because I know it does very much concern um, uh, those living there and those um, who regularly like to use the park. Yeah. Uh, so I think um, just like every other area of site in the city, we will always be looking to keep sites under review um, from where they're um, being used for an unlawful encampment. Um, I think in terms of looking at how the park will be laid out and made secure in the parking arrangement. They will come as part of, that will come as part of the master planning arrangements and the consultation process that will go through. I'm sure there'll be many different diverse views about what, what are the priorities in terms of master planning the park. Hmm. And what we're agreeing is now the bid for the money to go into the detailed work. So we don't have all the detailed answers at this point. Um, do we want to go to part two to look at the part two report? Okay, right. So we'll hold off on voting on this until we've gone to part two. Right, I now propose that we move into part two under section 100A brackets two of the Local Government Act 1972 as amended, as the part two reports contain exempt information as, designed, as defined in schedule 12A, comma, part one. So, I love that bit. <laughs> I don't know why, it's just so detailed. It's, I have no idea whether that's really the right bit. Is that the right bit, Abraham? Okay. <laughs>